too much, and sorry you're on Zoom, on um, yet another Zoom meeting. Um, for everybody just in the room, the Zoom folks are viewing us through the camera in the back, so don't pick your nose, they're going to see it, right, or don't do anything terribly embarrassing. So we've got that going on. Let me give you guys a couple of housekeeping things. Most importantly, where's the bathroom and the coffee? If you haven't figured out, the coffee's right there, that's important. The second most important part is the bathroom, because that goes after the coffee, and that is through over this way. Follow, follow the maze around there and you'll find us. We do have plenty of food out there, feel free. We'll have snacks at break because let's face it, we're adult learners and we all need snacks to keep us interested. There's brownies at your desk by all means and boxing gloves. Public service announcement, please don't hit your neighbor with the boxing gloves. And let's not try not to hit our speakers, at least not until they're done. Um, or me, preferably, I should put that in there too. <laughs> So, a couple quick things I wanted to say, all right, we have rules of engagement. We may or may not have the press as part of our audience, um, and so just recognize that everything will probably be on the record for anybody who needs to know that. Um, you obviously, by being in the camera shot, or on a camera shot for Zoom, just like the rest of America, um, and we'll see. We are around and available to network, do all the things, all the stuff, right? So if there's somebody that you want to meet, we want to make sure that we introduce you. So without further ado, I want to first give a shout out to our location sponsors, uh, Scott Mendelson, who may not be here, and Kristen Rebeck, who might be out there. So they got a shout out. Hello. <laughs> I also wanted to shout out to our boxing club sponsors, which is M&T Bank, uh, specifically John, sorry, John Haley and his team. They just screw up his last name. All good. Thank you, John. Hello there. Oh, you know, good way to remember it. Coffee, more coffee. Here's why we like John. A, he's a badass banker who buys boxing gloves, and B, he has boots. So he has a couple of bottles of some fun stuff. I don't even know what it is. And we'll be doing a drawing at the end of the, um, the day. So 
or the end of the event, if you will. So you guys can find John outside in a, after we start our speaking um, and drop your business cards in and hopefully win a bottle of something. What is it, John? What do we have? A bottle of scotch, bourbon, and tequila. Because quite frankly, you're probably going to need it after this discussion. So guys on Zoom, if you hear that, you're missing out on scotch, bourbon, and tequila. So should have been here. But we appreciate you being here virtually. So, any questions, anything before we get started? And I introduce our first speaker. Katie, are you at stage right or left? <laughs> All right, without further ado, we're honored to have Chris Cleary. He's the principal cyber advisor of the Department of Navy. And he does not have slides, so that's- Do not have slides. We do not have slides. And you were here within Zoom shots. So we checked all the boxes. Yeah. I feel like we've done all the things. Yeah. So at every government's event with every speaker, we always ask this, who are you and what makes you an expert in your field? So- uh, There we go. Great I'm question. I'm gonna get out of your way. Start off. So uh, Chris Cleary, the first principal cyber advisor for the Department of the Navy, which uh, for those of you who are tracking the position or not, uh, was mandated by the uh, 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, sort of following suit with what OSD appointing a principal cyber advisor at the DOD level, they said each of the services should do that as well. Okay, well, what makes me uniquely qualified to do this job? That's a great question. Um, I'm not exactly sure what makes me uniquely qualified to do this job, other than I am a part of my environment. Uh, I've done a lot of different things. I've been officer, I've been enlisted, I've worked in industry, I've been in the military, I've been active duty, I've been reservist, I've been in a tech startup that failed miserably. Go yes, all the things. She can validate for that one. I will validate that one. Uh, yeah. I was with a company that went public, I've worked for a couple of different defense contractors, and now I've had the opportunity to come back into the uh, government, working for the Navy, working directly for the secretary who was just put into the office yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, so we have a brand new secretary of the Navy um, to sort of do what we're going to do with, with cyber. Uh, okay, so what does that mean? Well, the, the chief information officer I, and I have a unique relationship as it pertains to how we do things within the Department of the Navy. The chief information officer is responsible for the uh, information environment as defined by Joint Pub, which is one of those things. For the military background, if you were going to look at Joint Pub 312 and you really want to get into the, the nuts and bolts of it, you know, knock yourself out, read all that. Uh, where we overlap is cybersecurity, which is going to be some of the backdrop of this conversation. I got a couple of anecdotal stories I'll tell in a second. But really, where the PCA comes in is more as we start sliding the program into the right of cybersecurity, we get into things like cyber resiliency, weapon systems, critical infrastructure. And then further to the right, you get into cyber operations that I'm going to really, I'm really talking warfare. So the PCA is, you know, as we've sort of defined our lanes in the road, it's really about kind of bringing this idea of warfare. Uh, back into the departments uh, and how cyber and how we're going to sort of integrate cyber into the department uh, or, you know, engaging our adversaries. All right, so uh, we haven't been in person in a long time. Actually, last night I couldn't sleep. I was really excited to do this. Was, to be perfectly honest with you, I was really looking forward to this. Uh, but I didn't know the title was Sucker Punch until I saw my picture, you know, with that like... Yeah, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, 14 on them. You know, a lot of these, right? So uh, I was like, oh, sucker punch, that's really cool. Maybe I can, maybe I'll go down some crazy path. I'll go off the reservation because one thing I want to say is when we, you know, when we talk to us, I think, you know, we're kind of an echo chamber, right? We're all cybersecurity professionals. Uh, there's very few things you're going to hear me say. They're like, oh, wow, public-private partnership, again. Um, sharing of information, important, again. CMMC, important, again. I got all that, and you get all that. Uh, so, so what can I add to the conversations that's, that's different? It's not this. Uh, and more importantly is as we do that, what I like to tell the people in these audiences when I give these talks, it's not about us. You know, we're, we're, we're all believers, right? We're all a part of some funky religion we call cyber and we're all here. That's why we believe it. That's why we're trying to do it. It's really about taking this to the unwashed masses who don't get this, right? To, to kind of champion these causes outside of these circles and bring it to the people who don't, you know, for your respective organizations, you know, for me in the Navy, it's the other war fighting communities to get them to appreciate what, uh, what cyber is and how it impacts their mission space. So back to the sucker, sucker punch thing. And I had a different little analogy thinking about it last night. You know, sucker punch implies somebody sneaking up behind you and cold cocking you in the back of the head when you're not doing it. I think in the, the cyber fight we're in right now is a little more akin to mixed martial arts, right? You're in a ring with somebody and, and you're kind of, you know, there's, and there's really no rules. And if you go to the beginning of mixed martial arts, uh, it started with, you know, a boxer fighting a wrestler and a wrestler fighting a karate guy and a karate guy fighting some other skill or just some brawler who came in off the street. 
And what you saw is mixed martial arts over a period of time pretty much morphed into what it is today, which is, for those of you who are familiar with the art, it's kind of an art between uh, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Muay Thai. Muay Thai being the striking component of it, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu being sort of the grappling side of it. But what's unique about the sport is you can, you can defeat your adversary one of two ways. You can knock them out, which is cool, that's what everybody likes seeing, or you can get them to submit. And I think we're really in a, in a fight where we're kind of in getting submitted. So I spent a year at uh, the Joint Special Operations Command. Actually, they were really into this, this uh, fighting program. I used to do it. Uh, it was really cool to, to learn some of the mixed martial arts things. And where guys were trying to help me, were like, Chris, you're a big guy. You know, what you do not want to do is go to the ground with an opponent who knows how to grapple on the ground because you are going to get submitted. And which was true. When I was learning to do it, I just wasn't quick enough. The best that I could do is prevent from getting wrapped up. I like that better. But I was never really good at submitting my opponent. Um, and I think that's where we are right now. We're basically in this, in this prolonged fight with our adversaries, trying not to be submitted, trying not to tap out. Okay, so, so why do I say all that? Because I think this is, we're, we're in a warfare continuum. And you, you hear a lot of discussion right now about this continuity of conflict, right? This competition uh, continuity, which says there's sort of three different phases you find yourself in with your adversary. And what's strange, you can find yourself in all three phases at the same time. You're either a, a, some sort of cooperation, you see that through, through our nations as we do, you know, humanitarian aid after there's a hurricane or a, or a, a tsunami. Um, you can find yourself in competition below the level of armed conflict, or you can find yourself in conflict. And there's studies where if you look at like things that have happened in World War II, or you might even think things that happened in the Middle East, uh, we can be at all three situations at any one time. So again, why is that important? It's important because this is, again, this is the fight that we're in. When people talk about warfare and the warfare continuum, one of the things that we think is we're not in conflict. I think our adversaries think very, very differently about that. We have to change our way of thinking because of it. Um, our adversaries see conflict differently. Our adversaries' conflict is, and I go back to, so, you know, Naval Academy guy, graduate of the War College and all those unique things. And this idea is what is warfare? What is war? Um, we're taught to see war through this idea that it is conflict. This is the engagement of two masses. It's about the defeating of your adversary. Well, if you go back to Clausewitz, you know, Clausewitz and Mahan are the sort of the things that we learn in the West, right? It's about defeating your adversary. It's about getting your adversary to succumb. But war is simply about getting your adversary to, to comply to the, what you want them to do. Uh, we've seen that traditionally through this idea of armed conflict. Well, then now that when you start walking it back a little bit and you start looking at the way our adversaries are engaging us, it's always about armed conflict. It's just about conflict. And you look at the fight we're in right now. Look at things that they're doing non-kinetically to impose costs in the way that we do business. You know, if you think of this from a large strategic sort of grand plan, that's all part of the design. How do I keep you from going to conflict, but how do I get you to expend resources uh, that takes money and time and effort away from things that you would probably prefer to be doing? Uh, you know, when you look at our adversaries in the first and second island campaign, if you look at sort of the Eastern philosophy of flight, fighting, the Sun Tzu kind of model, uh, one, of the, one of the lines that I like the best as a you know, former military planner, Sun Tzu said, uh, you know, first you attack the, your enemy's plans, then you attack his alliances, then you attack his armies, and finally you attack his fortified cities. Again, look at what our adversaries are sort of doing to us to engage our plans. You know, we also in the West have learned conflict through the, through the ways that we all grown up, chess, checkers, poker, football, basketball, baseball. You know, the, object, the objective that we've all grown up with in the West is to get the king, take the checkers, take all the money, score more points with these defined rule sets. Um, the Chinese play a game called Go. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Go. Anybody heard of Go? You know, and I just started playing it online just recently just to sort of figure out this game. But Go is not a game of, of, of dominance. Go is a game of envelopment. Over a period of time, you envelop your adversary. You, you just outmaneuver your adversary. It's not about defeating him. It's about outmaneuvering him. Again, look at the ways that we're engaging with particularly the Russians and the Chinese right now. It's not about you know, conflict. It's not about... Well, hopefully, it's, hopefully it doesn't get to conflict, but it's this game of maneuvering. It's this game of envelopment. Uh, and I think this is sort of the game they're in with the Chinese in particular as they maneuver around us. You know, the fight that we want to have or the fight that we're preparing to have is the first and second island campaign in the defense of, uh, you know, an invasion in Taiwan scenario. I don't know if that's the fight they want to have with us. Or if it is the fight they want to have with us, they're preventing it or they're trying to avoid it by doing all these other things. So now we talk about supply chain and maybe the sort of the root, the root discussion of this conversation. So there's two more uh, 
books that I'm a big fan of that have sort of shaped my thinking, and this is how I try and take this knowledge back to the Department of the Navy. Um, one is a book written by two Chinese colonels called Unrestricted Warfare, written back in 1999 after the uh, pretty much their observation of how we conducted the first Gulf War um, and sort of their lessons that, that they observed the way that we fought, the way that we learned how to do joint operations in particular. Uh, and what they, what they derive from that is when they start talking about, you know, this, this idea of unrestricted warfare is the first rule of warfare is there are no rules. You know, I'm not going to choose to fight you the way you want to fight me to see the sort of comments I made about Sun Tzu. Um, then you flip from there to this other book written by Graham Allison, which is like, I, I'm a big fan of it, is this concept of destined for war. Are anybody familiar with the Thucydides trap construct? It's one of my favorite things, right? What Thucydides trap is, is Thucydides, a Greek philosopher after the Peloponnesian Wars, wrote the Peloponnesian Wars. He sort of coined as being the first uh, historian ever. And, and his observation was, and the, the way the line goes, it was the rise of Athens and the fear it instilled in Sparta that made war inevitable. And basically what that says is you have an established power and you are rising power. And eventually as a, as a power rises to, to get on parity with the established power, uh, they'll fight. So Graham Allison conducted the, uh, the, the Harvard, Harvard Kennedy School. They looked over the last 500 years and they've seen this condition exist about 16 times. 12 of those resulted in war. So when you look at those conditions and you sort of map it to the US and the Chinese, they're like, well, this is a prime Thucydides trap model. Are we destined for war? Now, it's an interesting book. He makes arguments for and against. Uh, I'm, you could probably flip a coin as to where we're at, but uh, this is definitely, this condition is existing. And this is something that we're being very, very aware of. So then you move forward back to this idea of unrestricted warfare. Now I'm gonna bring it back to the supply chain. Um, in 1941, four hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, President Roosevelt issued an order that said attack against uh, Japan or execute against Japan, I'm sorry. And basically what that was, was the order to conduct unrestricted warfare on the island nation of Japan, which is to go after basically commerce raiding and maritime shipping. What's interesting about that is in 1918, before that happened, uh, after, the, after the Germans used unrestricted warfare uh, against the British sinking Lutania and the Essex, another one, sorry. Um, there was a period of time for about 20 years where we tried to ban the submarine. The US was one of the leading uh, champions behind outlawing the submarine, making it an illegal means and methods of warfare. Well, obviously it didn't happen, but we did agree that we were only going to use the submarine in certain fashions. We still didn't subscribe to this idea of unrestricted submarine warfare that the submarine was being built specifically to engage, you know, capital ships of our adversary. It was, was built to engage, you know, adversaries, carriers, and battleships. So even we subscribed to this idea that we wouldn't go after maritime ship. But as soon as World War, I, World War II started, we changed our philosophy almost immediately because we realized that that's what needed to happen. Again, map that back to what's going on right now. You know, map this back to supply chain, to uh, um, intellectual property, commerce rating. You know, our adversaries are getting really, really good at that. Our adversaries are saying, this is the way that I'm going to engage my adversary, is I'm going to impose costs on him over time, the similar way that we would go after maritime shipping in, a, in an actual conflict to, to reduce the, the resources that adversary has to fight with. And, and I think this is one of these things we got to observe, which says to the, to the defense industrial base, to critical infrastructure, to supply chain is, is, again, I'm saying the military is not the target, or at least not going to be the first target. You guys are the target. You are the soft underbelly that's going to prevent the nation from being able to execute uh, what it's asked to go do when it's time to go do it. Now, the U.S. government's making some really good actions in, the, in, in addressing this and getting after it. The executive order from the president is one of those one of those ways. And there's nothing in the executive order that I fundamentally disagree with. Um, it, there are all the right things, but it's just but we are imposing costs on ourselves to respond to those things and making again our adversaries sort of hey guys, this is what I need you to do. Um, the last book, and then I'll, I'll be open for questions because, uh, again, I, I have a million of these little talking points that I use, and I cherry pick because a half dozen of them or so when I give these talks. I could literally stand up here and talk all day about this. It is my favorite subject. Um, the last one, because the CNO likes to use this, is Moneyball. Um, I'm sure everybody's seen the movie. I don't know how many people have read the book. Uh, but what Moneyball basically says was is, is this idea of, of it was, you know, it all got if you the Oakland A, the Oakland Athletics. If you, you know, for those who read the movie, it was hey, you know, there's teams with lots of money, there's teams with not a lot of money. How do we take this little bit of money and build a winning team? And what they found is they got it all down to one statistic, and was this idea of on base percentage, right? That I could offset my uh, 
uh, lapses and defects with just a little bit of offense. And they used Johnny Damon as an example as a center fielder that cost him a lot of money. And when Johnny Damon left, they realized they didn't have $7 million to replace Johnny Damon at center field. Uh, and they assessed that the next best center fielder they could put them or put in center field over time would cost them about 12 runs over the aggregate of the season. But they said, I could offset those 12 runs with finding people with good odd-base percentages that I can get for dirt cheap. And this was this whole idea. So how do I take a little bit of money? And this, their whole idea was a little bit of offense and outweigh a lot of defense. We spend lots and lots of money on defense. Uh, our you know, Department of the Navy is investing in offense, but, but the cost of doing an offensive cyber attack or those things is significantly less expensive than building a Ford across aircraft carrier or supporting the Joint Strike Fighter program. I think our adversaries have figured that out. I think we're coming, we're beginning to come to some of those conclusions, which gets into this last thing. And I mentioned it the last time, this idea of an infinite game. <clears throat> so I'm a big subscriber to the Simon Snack, start with why infinite game. I'm a really big, you know, that's a, one of the things that shaped my thinking. And, and we are in an infinite game. If for those of you who are unfamiliar with the construct, is a, and I'm going back to sort of the football, basketball versus go kind of analogy, is, a, you know, traditionally the games that we play have players, have rules, have beginnings, have endings, have defined, uh, defined a set of standards of what constitutes a win. More points, take your money, get your chess pieces, whatever. One infinite game, uh, the rules can change, the players can change. And the only way that you fall out of an infinite game is you either lose the resources or will to continue. You could kind of map that back to the Cold War, what we did to the Russians. You know, we kind of, they sort of lost the, the resources to continue the way they wanted to continue the fight. And they sort of sat on the sidelines for a period of time. So, you know, warfare is an infinite game. There is no ultimate weapon that's going to come out that's going to stop warfare. Cybersecurity, cyber is an infinite game. There's no tool that's going to come out that's going to stop this. Uh, zero trust, I'm a huge subscriber of zero trust. I'm a huge believer in it, but it is not the last thing that we're going to go do. We're not going to roll out zero trust and say, guys, we fixed this problem. We got to move on. The only way that we get to this, ultimately, I think playing this infinite game mentality is the same way we would look at, you know, if you were building a home today, you know, you don't ask for central heating or electricity or water in a home. It's just the way they're built. But yet we're still in this model of ensuring that security gets mapped into everything that we do. It shouldn't be an add-on. It should be just that's, that's how you do things. So when we start thinking about, particularly in the Department of the Navy, how we spend money or how we export, how we, you know, uh, you know, expend resources for cybersecurity. Well, it's one of those things we can quantify right now because I can say there's program A and we spend X amount of dollars on cybersecurity. What we're hoping to is in a couple of years, I don't really see that there's no separate line item for cybersecurity within the development of a weapon system. It's just a requirement of the weapon system. You know, a requirement of a ship is that it floats, right? That's not a design specification of a ship. It, you know, an airplane needs to fly. It's like airplane must fly. Well, yeah, it's an airplane. Um, but the difference is when you look at, uh, you know, of warships and merchant ships, there's a lot of things that they share in common. Uh, actually, you could say 90% of a merchant ship has the same characters as a warship. But one of the fundamental design characters of a warship is somebody's going to think about putting it at the bottom of the ocean. It has additional things built into it to ensure its survivability. Not only weapon systems, but additional you know, damage control systems and defensive systems, knowing an adversary is going to want to engage this through some form of kinetic warfare. We've got to get that mindset. And when I talk about the way that we build networks, as a guy who sat in both the commercial world and the government world, is we have to start thinking about building our networks the same way we start thinking about building warships if these networks are ultimately the things that are going to be attacked. You know, uh, an Arleigh Burke class destroyer is not a COTS piece of equipment. The Joint Strike Fighter is not a COTS aircraft. You know, but we, think, we seem to think that through going to industry and getting a lot of COTS equipment, we can just piece it together in such a way it's going to be resilient or be survivable as a, you know, a, a, a means and methods of warfare. And this is one of these learning curves I think we're experiencing right now. And to understand that, you know, we're going to get back into this resource game. We're really going to build the systems that we want to build. Uh, yeah, they're, they, sometimes they're going to be expensive and sometimes the requirements behind them are going to be challenging. Uh, but with that. Wait, me sure, first. Yeah, you first. So. Yes. Given what you just said. Yes. Loaded question. Loaded question. Does DOD, does the federal government understand that costs are going to increase? Yes. There is no way that we can carry this all out. And most of the people in our audience are small business contractors. You used to be a small business contractor. I mean, you know 
And this means we have to add it to our bids. We have to add it to our GNA. We have to add it to whatever. Is the government really willing to pay for it? And not just talky talk about it. Uh, well, at the end of the day, they're, they're going to have to. If that's the cost of doing business, they're not going to like it. And I think they're ultimately see the, the cost that they've imposed in the environment with all these additional requirements. And, and so there's a, there's a, there's a general, uh, Senator General Schmidl, he was the, the deputy commander, commander of Cybercom a couple of deputy commanders ago. And he used to say, like, we buy cyber by the mouth, right? There's this idea of, you know, again, I get it. I continue to pay for it. I'm not exactly 100% sure what I'm getting for it. Right. So trying to quantify this. And I think CMMC is, when we start getting a little more into it, we're going to run into some of these issues of, well, my, all right, I've imposed all these things. Is it all improving this far, what I'm getting? Exactly. Yeah. So that that would just be, please take back that small business. We're, we're tracking. Be aware. Okay, let's ask a couple of quick questions. And I'm so sorry, you guys, we have six minutes and I'm keeping us on flight and on schedule. You had your hand up first and I totally cut you off. So you get to go first. <laughs> Not at all. Thanks. He saw, I acknowledge yeah. the, the wisdom in reef points. It's almost like this. You, uh, can, you yeah. can see it, right? It's yeah. one of the strategies. Nobody ever defended their way to victory uh, and pay attention to choke points. And every cyber node is effectively a choke point, right? Sure. Um, the question, Chris, I've got is, does the Navy have a good handle on supply chain security? I mean, right, that's what we're talking about here. And if not, what has happened to do it? Because we're buying it by the pound because we sort of don't really have an overarching strategy. It's a distributed network that was designed to be open. And yeah, well, that's kind of still going to work. Then. Yeah, so what what we did mean, is there's many supply chains. There's a supply chain of how we how we bring on, let's say, software, and then there's a supply chain of how oil gets from, or you know, petroleum gets from point A to point B. So uh, logistics, you know, I think the Navy would put it in this term of, you know, logistics is one side of the coin supply chain is maybe the development of some of these things might be the other. Um, so, yes, uh, but they understand that is one of our one of our critical vulnerabilities in any of these fights, particularly when you're looking at 7,000 miles of ocean to cover. Sir. Yeah, so if we know supply chain is probably one of our biggest vulnerabilities, right? Because on a lot of layers, when you get right, so software. Make sure you speak loud. Yeah. Um, um, sorry. So software, people are that supply chain as well, resources. Mm -hmm. So if we know it's a problem, the problem, the issue starts with commercial, right? Because we're, we're the source of the supply that's coming to the government. Mm -hmm. So how does the government marry that? How does the government help solve the entire problem, military, help solve their entire problem with commercial, with industry, knowing that the military is going to be the consumer as well, the, the industry is, is the supply. Well, so that, you know, there's lots of individual initiatives like DevSecOps, right? You know, how we're going to try and validate all the requirements that went into the, you know, the, the executive order that said, you know, the, the, the validation of that security is built into your software. Um, I, I, you know, my running joke with, you know, solar wind, I get a kick out of, you know, when we all begrudgingly have to go to, you know, the hacker awards and, you know, politely clap as the Russians go up to accept their, their award for the solar winds attack. You know, and so as a military planner, where I cut my teeth, you, you, you have to tip your hat to what they did. I mean, you can't not but respect it. Um, well, it was, it took, but, you, but that just wasn't something they cooked up in the, you know, that was a deliberate, dedicated, thought through, resourced, um, supported, advocated, all those other words, whatever happened in the back room of some skiff in, you know, Moscow. You know, hats off to you guys. Well, well done. Well, well, it was, yeah, you can't do anything but respect it um, and then try to learn from it. And that's what we're doing. But we're, again, it's going to say how hard this problem is. And solar winds absolutely is showing up in a couple more times yeah. today, I promise. We'd be remiss if we didn't. To go back to your strategic analogy, we, the U.S. seems to be if in the cyber realm, staying in the submarine only against capital ships. Um, model where we'll, we'll attack Iranian centrifuges, we'll attack some other state uh, uh, actors, but we don't go after Alibaba, we don't go after Russian pipelines, um, we don't go after the commercial assets where China and Russia obviously go after ours. So I'm going to I'm going to choose my words carefully. Because Margo is okay. notes furiously. Uh, yes. On the record, on the record. So, uh, Chris Cleary, the individual, uh, as a history major, because I failed calculus at the Naval Academy and I was forced to go down the history route if I want to graduate, um, <laughs> it is, is, has now. That's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's a chemistry thing going on. to acknowledge this, this idea of uh, Chris Cleary, the individual, uh, 
Oh, how do I choose my words? Um, uh, I am. I would acknowledge that unrestricted warfare is the thing that will probably happen if when we get into a if we get into a some sort of engagement, right? The problem is we don't recognize that parts of the constructs of unrestricted warfare we're experiencing right now. We just don't call it this. So we don't recognize it as that because everybody in uniform has grown up that warfare is conflict, not at warfare until somebody's fired at me. I'm sort of the other school of thought to say, you know, there's lots of different levers that nation states can pull to make me succumb to their will. This is one of them. We're not recognizing it. Now, do I think the, <laughs> um, am I a fan of opening the aperture for targets as we, as we begin to figure out how to move through this engagement? I think you have to be. You can't constrain yourself simply to these things that we, uh, Talon Manual, anybody familiar with the Talon Manual? For those of you who are cyber nerds, again, it was written in Talon Estonia. It was basically, a, if you took laws of armed conflict, rules of, rules of engagement, Geneva Convention, and you sort of map cyber on top of it, that's what sort of the Talon Manual does. Constitutes what an attack is, you know? Rule 41 in the Talon Manual, attack is something designed to degrade or kill, which gets into a whole other talk track is, you know, my little, oh, Oh, all right, so she's cutting me off. Uh, uh, yes. So that. <laughs> all right, final, I'm, yeah. your choice. One last question or final thought. We're in nine o'clock. I'm going to give you one more thought because I think this is something that we could all we should be better with. Um, I think that, that there's things that the military has taken from industry and the industry has taken from the military. Or, and, and one of them is this concept of the word attack. Um, I think we got to walk this back. We use the word attack for everything, which means it's beginning to lose its meaning. The government has a very, the military has a very specific definition of what an attack is. It's something designed to destroy or kill, which means we respond to those things in a very unique way. Rules of engagement are sort of come into effect, you know, you know, attacking in kind sort of thing. But if we call every single thing that happens an attack, we, it begins to lose its sensitivity. You know, when we are, you know, Stuxnet was an attack. <coughs> Saudi Aramco was an attack. Sony was an attack. SolarWinds? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not ready to call SolarWinds. It's a great, great uh, uh, espionage campaign, great way to get access to information, but you didn't break or kill anyone, kill anyone, right? You didn't tip that threshold or you didn't indicate that you were trying to do one of those two things. So I think we got to walk back this word attack because then when we use it, it means something. And, and my, my, I'll just say this joke real quick. So, because if my daughter, who's in college, and I have a daughter number two going to college, she calls me on the phone and said, Dad, I've been attacked. I'm getting my gun and I'm driving to whichever college she's, she's at. But the two. And then I show and she opens her email and she says, look at the spear phishing email I got. Right? No, not an attack. Right? This is because we've overused this. You know, we've, we use it in such a way that we, if companies say, hey, I am being attacked. There are certain things that, that I wouldn't expect companies to be able to withstand. That's why you pay taxes. That's why you have the military. That's why you have these other resources. I don't, and, and I think one of the misnomers of this environment is we continue to levy requirements on you. And this great industry has grown up, so just buy all these products, install them in your environments, and you should be okay. That's like saying, I have the resources to buy a fire engine, I'll put it in my driveway, right? You know, I should be able to pick up a fire extinguisher and put out a small fire. My roof is on fire, I'm quickly outside of my depth, even though I might have the resources to go get those kind of tools to respond. That's what government is for, that's what, that's what nation states are for, that's what we should be doing. I think we gotta move close to that. And I think CISA, uh, Jen Easterly in that environment is going to help us get there. I'm a fan of Jen. I'm a fan of what Jen's doing. I'm a fan of Chris Inglis and what he's doing. We all came from CyberCon around the same times. I think there's a good team on the field right now that all know each other. They're now in different organizations and have relationships built up. So I think you are going to see a lot more collaboration between these different environments just because you know, we all came from the same what? place. Yeah, Robert, I, what? What? I'm sorry. I, I, are you I just going to drop a bomb on us and say that you I think, think there will be better. collaboration do. among us? I do. DOD and the federal government. Yes, I do. I drop it there, sir. <laughs> that is, that, <laughs> yes. All right, got it. <laughs> government should be supporting just government or should be supporting Best Buy and Bed Bath and Beyond? Well, so again, this is Chris Cleary's opinion. Yeah. Uh, everybody pays taxes. You know, if, if you dial 911, somebody shows up. Whether you're choking, got active shooter, there's a fire. I think we've got to expand that. Hey, there's things that you shouldn't be expected to respond to. Hey, who's going to come help me? There has to be an organization to do that. We shouldn't put all the onus on 
the individual to be able to survive a nation state level attack. I wouldn't know. We're stopping there. We're not going to say that. And he did not say that for the record. All right. Thank you so, so much. It's so great. All right, good talk. For anybody standing, we do have, I'm glad he's on the seat, thank you. There's one more seat there, two more seats over here if you guys need to keep everybody going. Uh, yes, this is the one. All right, John, where's John? Guys, I can't explain why there's a big hole in the middle of the freaking conference room other than this is the worst plan. Like, I'm sorry I can't see anyone over there because there's a big hole in the middle, but here we are. So pretty sure they didn't design it. Um, either this was the worst engineering project ever or they repurposed this room. Um, so anyway, sorry about that. All right. You ready? I'm ready. I'm going to get my other cup of coffee, which well, means you should get I'm, I'm ready to get lit up. That's what we're going to do. Here. <laughs> you guys ready for this? All right. John, Vice President of Business Development at Fortress Information Security. You are here to talk, us, uh, talk to us, well, actually establish ground based on understanding the supply chain security. Who are you and what makes you an expert in your field? Well, um, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I work in small businesses, have been in the, the DOD and broader federal space my entire career. Uh, specifically, I have an expertise in taking uh, very small businesses and growing them, always in regulated fields. So that's that's my expertise. I come, I dive deep into regulated, I dive deep into to regulated spaces. I really then study those regulations and then how they apply to industry. Uh, and then I, I grow companies around, ostensibly helping companies like yours or sometimes larger companies uh, to meet those requirements as effectively and hopefully inexpensively as possible. Uh, and in this particular case, there are uh, a slew of regulations that I'll touch on, but not read to you uh, that we can we can hit on today. And so that's a little bit of who I am and my expertise. All right. Well, you have slides, so you're going to drive those. Uh, I will you're drive, drive those with that. And be careful because we've deliberately set it up to jury rig. So we will laugh at you a lot if you fall. I will try not to fall. But, uh, <laughs> try not to I, fall. I can't promise. So uh, a couple of things on the slides. We put these together so you would have something after the fact to read. Uh, I will brief maybe a tenth of the slides here, but I'll, I'll have them for, for visual aids. And and I think what, what Chris has done really well is to argue, articulate the strategic uh, threat. And I'm sometimes a little bit more blunt than he is. When it comes to supply chain, we are losing. We are losing badly. Uh, and all of the evidence supports that. And the people in this room, the small business owners, you are America's greatest weapon to defeat these adversaries. The practical reality is, is the era of big companies innovating has concluded. Small companies innovate. Small companies create the weapons and defensive tools to keep our country safe. And as a result, you are the primary target for the majority of, uh, I don't know if we want to call them attacks, but espionage and things of that nature. Uh, as a result, uh, we sort of, as a group, have a unique responsibility to make sure that we can continue to defend our way of life from an adversary who's uh, very intelligent and pernicious, uh, but also understand that we need to do that, you know, make your bet first before you try to save the world. And that's so I, I open with this question. That's ominous. Okay. Uh, you know, can, 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 you, can you spot the risky product? I, I can't. I can't. But I promise you that one of these devices is bad. The other one is horrendous. I will, we'll get to that in the end, but, but this is the, this is the crux of the real threat. And, and having been a, a small business guy, most of my career, uh, I'm, I'm very practical in how I spend small business dollars. I was always the guy who was like, okay, let's hold it to the bleeding edge. I can't afford more capital expenses. Uh, that's so you'll hear, uh, as we touch on, on some of these things, my advice to small business is do what you have to do and you have to do it. Because uh, you have to be competitive. Now, the reason to talk about supply chain is obvious. There have been a slew of supply chain attacks. Uh, you'll hear solar winds. You're going to hear gas line pipelines come up today. But, but the crux of it is, is this has been a continuing story now for, for close to a decade, and it is coming to a head. The adversary understands that this is the aperture to get us. We are weak. Uh, the chicken factory in, in Iowa doesn't want to spend on cybersecurity. We turn that factory off, and chicken prices go up 15%. The small business company who won an OTA, 
right, who has an SBIR, you are inventing the new multi-frequency radio, you're inventing the new cybersecurity tool, you're developing the new system of systems at your agency. Well, I'm going to try and hack you if I'm the adversary because I want to have access to all the government's records. You're the aperture to do that. So I'll leave these things for read aheads, but, but this is what this has resulted in. I'm not going to read everything here, but you're welcome to read the summary. But these are the regulations that are currently seated. These are signed, sealed, and delivered. And, and you'll notice I do have CMMC on there. I'm a big proponent of CMMC, but I will tell you CMMC is five years away for most of us. I'm not telling you not to prepare. I think you ought to. I'm not telling you not to do the things you, you, you should to comply with NIST, but the practical reality is, is I think this year they're going to come out with three to five contracts that are requiring CMMC. Uh, they may require NIST compliance, but that's a different animal. But these other requirements here, these other uh, instructions, executive orders, they're in place today. Uh, most of these instructions and requirements were put in place at the end of the year last year, so they're just starting to matriculate forward. And this is where your biggest risk is. For a small business, this is also where your biggest opportunity is. And I think this gets to the crux of the name, sucker punch. So I think we've all been hearing CMMC till we're blue in the face. Yes. These are the ones you actually have to pay attention to because they're here. They're not coming in five years. And I want to make sure everybody understands that because that's why when Katie and I were talking about what we were going to put on for content, we were like, holy shnikes, we didn't know about this, right? Like we've all been like, and that's the idea of mine, sucker punch to your point. We've all been focused on CMMC. It is a new way that every management consultant around the Beltway is making money. We all know this, right? Like everybody's going to do all the things, all these procedures, blah, blah, blah. But then when we talked to John, we were like, what do you mean, this executive order? And what is the ramification for small businesses in the federal contracting space? And what do you mean, this is already in my contract or this is coming into my contract for the next contract month? So this is where we're like, this shit is real, guys. So this is the part. This is the sucker punch. This is the, oh my gosh, did you guys even know this was out here? Sorry, John. No, I, I, think, I think that's good. And that's, so I'll, I'll hit on the high levels here. So small businesses, many of whom who have GSA contracts, how many of you don't have to raise your hand, but ask yourself, did I sign that NDAA Part A, Part B stipulating, and you might not remember, but it's the John McCain Act, i.e. I don't have Huawei, in my supply chain. I'm sure if you, you want to- You really sign that mod. Yeah, people. yeah everybody here. We all sign that mod because you want to get paid. Yep. You sign the mod. <laughs> now, how, how many of you actually checked that you didn't have Huawei in your supply chain? How many know you have? Yeah, that's this is the hard part. The reality is everybody signed the letter. Nobody actually looked. Maybe what they did is they did this and they called uh, Jim from accounting and say, hey, Jim, did you buy something from Huawei last week? He's like, I don't even know what Huawei is. How about Daiwa? You know what that is? Sell it. Yeah, how do you, yeah, exactly. Nobody checked, everybody signed it. This is, the, this is the threat aperture. This is how the bad guys get at us. This is what I'm saying, this is already here. By the way, if you signed that paper and they find Huawei ZTE in your supply chain, uh, you're at serious legal risk. False Claims Act uh, is the risk here. Everybody's familiar with that. It used to be the government didn't check. That has now changed. They're now beginning to check. So if you signed the paper and you did mess up, the odds of you getting you know, hung on this it's real, whereas maybe last year before they were checking, you could sign blindly and, and, and not check. So it's here, you need to review because Huawei, ZTE, Daiwa, these guys are smart guys. They don't typically write Huawei on the chip anymore. What they do is they write their partner company's name on it. Literally, if you go to Shenzhen, the Huawei guys literally walk to the factory next door, literally. They ask their buddies, hey, will you print stamp my chip? And they do it uh, because the Chinese don't care about our regulations that you promised. They're very happy to happen to attack us uh, and very happy to, to cause compliance violations. Along those lines, there are some new executive orders that you guys ought to know. It's very hard to follow every executive order at high pace, but there's a piece in particular, President Biden's executive order on cybersecurity specifically mandates, we're now eight months away from this mandate, that anybody supplying critical equipment, that's hardware and software, will have to supply a software bill of material. Now, maybe nobody knows what the hell that is. Uh, and All I heard was eight months away. Yeah. Like, for real. We're, we are less than a pregnancy away from this now. Uh, that's how I measure everything. Uh, I, that's, that's, that's how I measure everything like that. I have a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and, and I calculate, okay. You have dad brain. Oh, okay. You have dad brain during the pandemic with kids at home. 100%. 100%. I haven't slept in years. Uh, that, that is my life now. 
I'm Catholic, so I've got like 10 more of these things coming. It's going to be great. <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so we're now less than a pregnancy away from this thing. And, and what is this? Well, a software bill of material, and there's experts here who will dive into this more. I'm going to hit you at a very high level. You need to get the ingredients in the software that you were supplying to government. Right? This is just like, hey, listen, when you, go, when you go to the grocery store and you pick up a Coke or a Pepsi, you turn it on. Listen, I can't read any of the words on there, but Cy Gum Gorbum is in everything, right? You know that it's there uh, and they have to supply that. This same ask is now being placed on the entire federal uh, aperture, all the dip, all of us here. We now will have to supply these for, for critical, uh, critical components. Basically, the government can say, hey, give me your ingredient list. Uh, that starts in eight months. There's a standard behind that that's driven by NIST and NTIA. But the long and short is be prepared. You are going to have to start supplying these. If you don't know how to supply them, you'll have to figure it out quickly. And if you have supplied something that has a bad ingredient in it, uh, like a DLL, right? That's a you know, dynamic link library that might have been written in Cyrillic because you pulled it from GitHub, uh, you're probably going to be in a little bit of trouble. And so we want to, you want to clean that up before you give over the, the goods to the, to the government. John, you say supply that you have to supply this. Supply this to who? Yeah, that's who a, is at, yeah, who's at. That's so the government is going to start asking for this when you re-up your contracts. So they're going to say, hey, congratulations, you won this very large contract to build the system of systems at my agency. It's critical. I want your ingredients list. I want it now. And we're not going to re-up your contract until you give it to us. So what I think I heard is that's going to come at, at the top. And so for those people who are in subcontract command, prepare for your primes to get this, which of course means it's going to flow, correct? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. So are we going to send this software to via our arrows.net email account to someone and- Well, sir, you <laughs> hated yourself in that reference. <laughs> it's good to have a list of parts, but now we've exposed said list of parts. Absolutely. So uh, the market is already beginning to produce solutions on this. Selfishly, our company is one of the companies doing that, but there will be several, many competitors in the space. Do not send the map to your vulnerabilities over email, please. Because I promise you, I promise you, there is somebody in China like, oh God, please use Hotmail. Right? <laughs> A lot of times we're using what the federal, our federal clients want, right? It may be on their mat list. It may be on whatever, you know, they call it. Um, what happens when what they have is a problematic ingredient, but we're told we should use it? Well, that's a, repeat the question. Yeah, so repeating the question, what happens if my client, the federal government, tells me to use something we know is vulnerable? Uh, so they have the authority to do that. That's awesome. Right. And, and they can do it. And there are some times where they might choose to do that. There isn't an alternative component. Software, hardware, this is the only manufacturer of the thing. This is the only DLL. Uh, and so you can do things to uh, protect from things that are organically weak. You know, I think about it. If you have a hole in your front yard, that's not good. You don't want your kids tripping in it. You put a, you know, you put a sign there and put a fence around it. All of a sudden, it's not so risky. So there are ways to do that. And we expect that will be the, the way forward there. But in practice, we're beginning already to see the decoupling between the American supply chain and, and broader supply chains, because this is how they defeat us. Uh, when we can't fight because they've turned off the lights, uh, when they've turned off the water, um, that's how we lose. Vago, I see a question. Uh, well, so the, the, my question is, and, and you and I have talked about this before, and Chris hinted on this, uh, as well, we, we don't want to impose cost. So at the end of the Bush administration, the idea was we're going to go to directive sort of fire standards. And then that was seen as, you know, nan, you know, the Obama administration came in, was supposed to carry some of that stuff forward and it was nanny state. So we have to figure out a different model to do it. And effectively, we didn't really secure anything. And there are, these parts are in weapon systems now under triple, right, uh, triple washed. And maybe somebody at the big primes doesn't know what the origin of that chip is because it carries one of their part numbers, not a Huawei part number on it, which, which has been one of your crusades. So how do we do this, right? I mean, how, what are, you know, you've thought a lot about this. It will impose costs on us. I mean, we're the guy who's sort of been smoking three packs of cigarettes a day for 50 years, like there's going to be a cost to it. 
So how do we do it? Yeah, that's so do it right. That's a, the first thing is that there's no getting around this, right? And you're going to hear this universally. There is going to be a cost. There, you can't have security for free, right? We can buy things using Chinese slave labor, right? That's going to be cheaper than buying something that was made in the United States or made in a NATO allies country or designed in a NATO ally country. There's no getting around it. Uh, but the cost is worth it. I would rather have nine working aircraft carriers than 10 that don't work because the Chinese were able to shut them off, right? And so there's a practical reality here uh, to get at this. This is, this is the thrust of, of sort of my expertise is how do you answer these sort of intractable problems, intractable ways. This is the crux is you need to have limited sharing, right? Between organizations, so business, the government is not gonna solve this for us. It's gonna have to be industry. We are the innovators. So how does that work? Well, my prime is now asking for the components I've supplied to this big system, right? As a small business, I don't wanna bear that cost upfront, but I wanna bear it as part of a contract. And so there are marketplaces currently being built uh, to support this. And ostensibly that, will, that, that is how this happens. So the government is gonna say to say Lockheed Martin, hey, give me all the, all the ingredients. Lockheed is gonna say to its 100,000 sub guys, I just need your portion of that, right? And you as the small businesses need to be prepared to deliver on that but you don't have to bear the cost immediately. You don't have to bear it all up front. You need to bear it as it comes. And by distributing the cost, uh, you know, if you look at it on high, right? The, the Chris Cleary level, wow, this is a new big new expense. But if you look at it at an individual business level, uh, it'll be much less expensive. And importantly, by doing it through shared marketplaces, which is what's gonna come to fruition here, the, that ability to share is gonna keep everybody safe. Because once somebody identifies that, hey, this component's vulnerable, this, this one came from a bad place, right? that's gonna get out and about, and that is gonna shift the market. That's so the availability of good stuff will increase and the supply of bad stuff will decrease over time. This is not a one-year solution. This is a, an evolution solution. I, I wanna go there, we'll come back here. Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I hear two things, um, cost and fear, right? Because I know this is my livelihood. I have to be able to bid right. contracts. In order to bid contracts, I gotta meet all these stipulations and not break my small business in the, in the process. Yep. Thank you. So, so I hear, so if we just take CMC, we mm -hmm. think five years away, yeah. that's an eon in yeah. IT. That's, that's, that's light years. When, uh, and it's gonna change when it gets to the- It's gonna, gonna change 40 years. times, completely agree. Right. So are we working ourselves into like a, a, a dichotomy where we're trying to solve a problem but we're creating another one? And it's costed me my small business in the process. That, that's a, the, the thing I want least. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a genuine entrepreneur, small business. I, I really believe what I said. Yeah. Small businesses innovate. We are the backbone of America, not the bigs that, that purchase from us. They just they conglomerate. We build innovation. That is what we do. A contraction in small business would be a devastating loss to the United States. We've already faced too much of it because of COVID and the new regulations. This is why. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm bearish on CMMC in terms of do something right now. I'm a fan of it in principle, mm -hmm. but this is what I'm saying. This is the thing you do right now. And we've got to talk about direct and indirect costs, right? The way to do this, the way the market is being built is you don't pay until you win or until you're bidding. That's so you don't break the back of your small business doing this up front, right? The big thing about CMMC, it's like, congratulations. I now need you to pay a $500,000 bill uh, before you win anything, or you can't bid. This is different. Right? This is different in this principled way. Uh, the overwhelming majority of those costs will ultimately be passed directly back to the client as part of the bidding and then winning process. And then through sharing that in marketplaces, it, it'll make this much more reasonable, uh, much more reasonable thing. And then fortunately, the market itself is gonna supply more, more availability. I see you're hitting the watch, so. Uh, you have eight was, more minutes. Eight more minutes. But I wanna make sure that everybody understands the difference between the two, right? Upfront costs that I'm gonna pay no matter what, when, not when. <laughs> Bid, no bid, or pay as you go, and if you win the contract, type of thing. Yeah. Correct. I just want to make sure. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Sharing. I think there's a fraction here. Is if you're looking at like a 90-10 situation, so you'll pay 10% up front, and then 90% is going to land when you win, because you're not on the hook to sign, right? Until until they send you that PO, you're not on the hook to sign, but you need to be reasonably confident you're not delivering poison in your bid, uh, and that's how this is going to happen. So there'll be heuristics up front to indicate, hey, I'm probably on the up and up. 
And then you'll have to really check after you've won, having built that cost into the client. Uh, one last question, and I want to touch on a couple more things. Well. Sean, go ahead. You only have seven more minutes. And I'm happy. 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 Uh, I, I wanna, We're I wanna, landing this plane on time. That, that, so being an entrepreneur, I like making money, right? I really hate it when people put things on my business, like, hey, make me bleed. Like, please no. I'm really trying to pay for college for these 10 kids I haven't had yet. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so the, the thing here is actually to look at the DOD instructions. I love it when I can have a differentiator from my competitors. I love to wield it like a cudgel. I love to talk smack to my competitors, not because I dislike them personally, but I just like winning, right? There are DOD instructions. They were signed in December. Go look at them specifically, the DODI 5000.90. It's brilliant. It's almost like somebody really wrote an amazing DOD instruction and people are just starting to learn about it. And it walks the government through the process of how it ought to be looking for supply chain risk. And it doesn't say you may, it says you must. Most of your PMs won't yet be aware of it. Like all DOD instructions, it takes like five years. But they're starting to become aware. And if you educate, your prime, the person you're, you educate your, uh, your government client on this, you can wield this to improve your P-Win. This is how you do it. You say, hey, you have to deliver on a clean supply chain. I can deliver you heuristics data. I can deliver you cyber data as part of my proposal demonstrating that I'm more secure than the competition. But so when you wanna go make a judgment, the government has a choice, the guys who haven't told you anything and my company who can tell you a lot of things. The companies who lead on this and use that as a cudgel will win more business. And this is what's a little bit unique in this because it's, this is a very patriotic thing. Would the government rather buy the device that's terrible or would they rather buy the good device? Well, they're going to rather buy the good device, uh, software, hardware. When I say device, I, I, I commingle the things. They're, they're one and the same these days. This is your opportunity. This is how you strike at this. This is how you grow your business. It's to utilize the existing instructions and to build those into your business process and so you can go win more business. And again, you're talking about very small amount of cost up front, big, big cost after you win, but you're passing that on to the client. Um, that, that is how you do it. I'm not going to stay on this too much more because I do want to hit on a couple of things. When we hear supply chain in the news, they're actually talking about three different things. Uh, and this makes it very tricky. Supply chain during COVID was overwhelmingly logistics, right? Can I get masks from one place to another? Uh, can I get chips from Shenzhen uh, or Taiwan? to my Ford, uh, my Ford plant, right? That's the logistics question. There's a second type of supply chain and you can see here, uh, supply chain management, that is a logistics when people talk about that. Um, the second part is they're talking about risk and resilience. So that is attestational type of risk, that is CMMC. So I wanna make sure that you've promised that you've done good stuff, right? You're compliant, that's attestational supply chain. And then there's IT management, which is, are you cyber secure partner, yes or no? When we're talking about supply chain today, we're talking about a subset. It's actually the subset that's going to bite you is cyber supply chain, right? And that sits right in that middle. And we want to make sure that that cyber supply chain is resilient, right? And so we're not buying everything from Shenzhen. We're not buying everything from one source. Our components to our software don't come from Russia. Right, so I think this is an important factor because you're going to hear supply chain used in 50,000 different ways. You probably already have. And that's so I wanted to really narrow on this one thing as you guys sort of delve in with the, the security experts and other folks today, what they're really talking about in, in the field of supply chain. Uh, I, I want to just show you one quick piece and then we'll go back to questions. But uh, what does an SBOM look like? Uh, you'll have an opportunity, I believe, today to do an exercise on this. It does not, this is not a sexy looking thing. Uh, nobody's like, oh my goodness, you've given me a list of, uh, you know, components uh, that, that uh, man, that's amazing looking. It's not amazing looking, but the truth of the matter is the overwhelming majority of vulnerability now exists here, right? It exists in these lines of components, right? And, and that is how the government is going to use these. They're going to continuously monitor these components to identify where there's vulnerability. I want to put this in perspective for you. Uh, just, just last week, excuse me. Friday before, uh, we were doing an analysis uh, of a company. The company looked great, a super patriotic company owned by veterans. I believe 100% of the employees are veterans. The, the device looked like it was a really good device, and we opened it up only to find that the firmware on that device uh, was basically written in China, and it was dialing home. And so anything you ran through this switch was going right back to Beijing. Uh, this device, uh, and, and many like it, you're, we're now finding on weapon systems critical information systems within government. We're finding them in factories, 
These are the switches that are powering the water and, and facilities related control devices. To be clear, and then we'll walk back to Chris Clear you mentioned Taiwan. We will not get the fight in Taiwan if they turn off the electricity because the fueling machines that actually fuel the planes to go fight the Chinese, they run electricity. And this is how they're going to get at us. This is how they strike, is they want to physically turn off our ability to fight. They want to steal all our data so they know what that fight looks like. Uh, there are some new standards here. Smarter people than me are going to come up and teach you about them. But this SBOM standard uh, is really driven from NTIA being managed by NIST. They currently have three recognized formats for that. The market will help you to coalesce around it. But be aware when we talk supply chain, we're talking cyber supply chain. We want that to be resilient. That's what the instructions are telling you. And of all the bill of materials you'll be supplying soon, the software bill of materials is the one that's going to bite you the soonest. You're eight months away, less than one pregnancy. So I'll, I'll pause there. I'll, I'll pause there and, and see if there are any further questions. And um, no, you only have one minute. I got one minute. So if we have any further questions, we'll take them with the one minute. I'm not a cyber guy, but I am a, a gearhead. And I perceive CMMC to be the catalytic converter uh, of the 2020s. And, and there are going to be some folks who will spend the time and effort to, to put on a new catalytic converter on their 68 Buick. And then there's going to be some that will sell it for scrap. Talk to us about the, the effect on small business as, as the extreme cost without a lot of uh, great talking points coming from the Pentagon and, and others in terms of, of return on that investment. Tell us how that's gonna come down because we have the White House that says we wanna do more business with small business, but then there's this and, and yeah, tell us how that's gonna go. Well, the two things are absolutely in conflict. And, and again, that's so when we, when we talk about CMMC, right? That is, hey, small business, you bear a giant cost. And if you don't, then you can't play. That will contract the market. I believe for that reason, uh, there are gonna be some substantial changes on CMMC. I can't get into too many details, but in specifics, uh, we briefed, literally my company briefed the White House on the 19th on this issue specifically. Although the president wasn't there, we know that the president is actually receiving a written version of that brief himself. Uh, we briefed uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, the, we did the Republican side this week, we'll be doing the Democratic side early September on this issue specifically. CMMC will bring a cost, but like I said, I, I'll tell you my company, we're trying to do the right things, we're following this, but I'm not gonna go pay, pay for a, a, a big uh, CMMC cost this year because the contracts aren't gonna require it for five. Conversely, the are required. You've already signed the NDAA Part A, Part B, but so you may already put yourself at serious risk and you will be supplying these SBOMs in eight months. So the one I would be looking at Go back to the name sucker punch, pay attention to this. And again, the cost will be relatively smaller because you're pushing them onto the client. And the important, the important factor here is that for those who play ball, unlike CMMC, which actually doesn't create new business for you really, this will create new business for you. This will create opportunities to innovate because if you're able to identify, hey, this is a poison, this is a poison part that everybody's pulling from GitHub, your company creates the safe American alternative, you now have a monster market because the entire government is gonna be looking to replace that component. Small business is the most adept at doing that. That's the big opportunity here. So hopefully that kind of strikes at, at least my view of the market, but I hope to see come to fruition. Thank you, John. Sorry, he would, and you will be around, right? All yes, day. I'll be around. Thank you, beer, all the things. So please come talk to John. He needs friends. Um, <laughs> what? It's true. I'm just saying. Come on. Back. All right, Carl, come on up. Um, next, we do a quick slide change. Everybody's still awake. Are we still here? Are we all depressed? Yes, I get it. I understand. None of this is fun. I know. I know. It's like drink, take your medicine. Get copies of the you will get copies of the slides if you fill out the survey because I manipulated it that way. Um, so, but you know, there we are. All right. Keep it rolling. Everybody good? I know we've got coffee in the back. There's a break after this. So adult learning time, I eat. We will feed you with more snacks just to keep you awake and happy. Eat your brownies if you need some sugar. All right, without further ado, I have the wrong paper in front of me. Sorry. Guys, this is Carl Wagner, uh, co founder of Confirm D. I just realized I just introduced you, and I'm like, who are you and what makes you an expert in your field? And I'm like, I just told you who you are, but why don't you do it again and do it better? <laughs> so, okay. Carl, who are you? Who am I? What makes me an expert? Um, yes, great please. to be here, guys. Um, 
So I was with the CIA for 29 years. And uh, after retiring, um, became an insider threat consultant for industry. And then was chief security officer at Tesla for a little while under Elon, which was a, a trip. Um, and trip then, to space or sorry, a trip? It wasn't a trip to space, but it was, it was a trip in its own right. Um, done a lot of advisory work for small Silicon Valley tech companies on how to break into government, um, in terms of government revenue and contracts. And um, now I'm a tech founder myself. Uh, that's where Confirmed D comes in. So it kind of um, speaks to my approach to, to risk and security. Um, we have a mobile app and a web app a platform um, on health security. My call it a COVID-19 vaccine passport is really a digital health wallet. But what I was really going to say to answer that question, uh, does anybody here speak Spanish? Raise your hand. You guys heard the saying, más sabio el, el diablo por viejo que por diablo, which means the devil knows more because he's old than because he's the devil. Yeah, I hope I'm not a devil, and I don't want to be old, but I have been around a little bit. And in 29 years with CIA, um, I worked against and with foreign intelligence services all around the world um, against um, proliferation programs. We were talking about supply chain before really anybody else is talking about supply chain, right? Um, and then taking that into industry, looking at um, security or enterprise risk management for Tesla. And now with my own several businesses, um, so that's, that's my perspective. And so after these 20 minutes, I just, or whatever, however long it's going to be and on, on time, give you the perspective uh, that you may not have about threat. What, what is uh, risk? It's, it's uh, vulnerability plus um, threat, right? We talk a lot about vulnerabilities. Um, you may or may not have had many opportunities to talk to the human beings who are in this kind of invisible underworld that... Um, pose a threat that run these programs that um, recruit the humans that do a lot of this, et cetera. I was one of those guys. So if you want to ask questions, here I am. Uh, somewhat of a limit as to how much I can say, but I'll say as much as I can. Um, but I, I want to ask you to participate. You're not going to have to bear your soul individually to the whole room, but I want you all to um, repeat after me, if you can, and say, it can't happen to me. It can't happen, it can't happen to me. That's pretty, pretty good. All right, come on, guys. Pretty good. It can't happen to me. It can't happen to me. Okay, good. Well, that's, that's um, something I've heard from a lot of the CSOs that I dealt with when I was at Tesla. And, um, but uh, obviously, that's not going to be what I want you to say towards the end of this. Um, that's what maybe a security uh, officer would say. But we want to be um, enterprise risk managers. We actually want to be enterprise risk leaders. And that probably is you in all of those hats and roles in your small companies, right? I'm the enterprise risk leader in my company. We've got eight people and um, they're all volunteer except for the two, two of them that need to pay. <laughs> so I have to be the enterprise risk leader. And that means that um, I need to understand the threat. Um, now, I want you to say, Carl is the invisible threat. Carl is the invisible threat. Because you got to put a face to it. You don't see these people out there. They're in their, you know, respective intelligence service headquarters. They're they're in other guises and roles. You know, maybe they look like me. Maybe they don't. Um, maybe you. Maybe one of you in here is one of them. But you won't see them. So see me and think about that. I am the invisible threat. So who are the who are the threats that we think a lot of? We think of China and Russia. We're not talking about every Chinese, every Russian. Um, we're not talking about people who are ethnically Chinese. We're talking about the state-sponsored programs of these countries. Um, and I really liked what Chris said, what John said, they think and act in a different way. So let's try to avoid mirror imaging and try to think it's, it's hard, easier for me because I've been out there most of my life was overseas, right? I don't really think like an American is a problem sometimes, it's strange. <laughs> um, it might be a little harder for you um, or it might not, but I just wanna give you some context as to you know what you might be up against and really why, at the end of the day, why is this? Because we have to go to bed and wake up in the morning and run our businesses. It's because it's another business differentiator for you. If you can identify these threats, you're the eyes and ears, okay? Uh, insider threat and insider um, threat monitoring tools are tools you put on your system to monitor threats. Your eyes and ears are the oldest insider threat monitoring system in, in, um, in history, right? And so it's the extent that you can be aware of these threats incorporate mitigation of those threats into your business and then 
highlight appropriately those threats, you're differentiating yourself from your competition. So let's talk about um, how those threats can manifest in 17 minutes. Um, so um, I'm the invisible threat. There's this whole sub subculture, right? Because it's a bit easier to understand when you think about the dark web, but this is a very technical group. And we know that you don't really see software per se. And so um, you're, you're better able to be aware of the, uh, the threats. But the, the Chinese and Russian threats, you could say North Korea and Iran, these, these, these um, countries are authoritarian and characterized by patience, pervasiveness, and perceptiveness. What do I mean by those three things? Um, long historical time frame, right? So uh, they don't get you now. It's fine. They can do seating operations. Maybe there's um, maybe there's students. I'm not saying they're ethnically Chinese. There's American students who've gone to China, who ended up. Um, I ran global counterespionage for CIA. Or it happened under me. Is my my last job. I was chief of counterintelligence operations. You know, um, spies come in all shapes, colors, and sizes. Um, but they're very patient. We're less patient because we've got to get things done. That's fine. We need to be aware of that patience and think um, in a different way about threats that might be out there. Whether it's patients in terms of the people they might put in front of you in the human supply chain, or patients in terms of these supply chain risks. You know, it's um, oh, we're going to set up a company to over time um, insinuate parts into the supply chain. They'll do it. We might not have the patience, but they will. They're pervasive. Um, I mean, we know it, but just think through the implications of it. Um, in these societies, you know, I can't have the government come to my house here. And I'm going to, you know, say, get the hell out of here unless you've got a warrant. That doesn't happen in China, right? So if you have a Chinese employee who's not even a U.S. citizen and they're working for you, um, could they be a threat? Maybe they're forced to be a threat because their family is being um, pressured back home. Um, same thing with Russia, you know, and so um, you have that. You've got the, uh, the fact that these companies have to do what the government asked them to do. You know, in some ways we, we always say, well, I envy China and Russia, right? Because they can, they can do whatever they want to do. They snap their fingers, everybody jumps and they have a very cohesive program. That's great, but I don't want to live in a society like that. So I'm proud of the way we are. Just that we've got to step up and we've got to be more interactive. You have to be the eyes and ears to meet the government halfway. We know the government has to be the one to respond to these, these, uh, these, these larger threats because no single company, large or small, can be responsible for offensive cyber operations, et cetera. But um, that it's your responsibility. We can't on the one hand say, gee, I sure wish we were a lot better coordinated and man, look how the Chinese and Russians and, and you not participate, right? Uh, plus it's good for your business, like I said. So they're pervasive. They're able to bring all the every lever um, into their programs, and the only way that's going to happen for us is if we participate. And then, um, you know, they're perceptive. They don't generally, um, and they do. We take advantage of it as an intelligence officer. I would do that. Um, fall, you know, down on mirror imaging, but we do. Well, they wouldn't do that because we wouldn't do that. That has nothing to do with it. That's a, that's that's. Um, what is that called? The fundamental attribution error, I think. Um, maybe it's maybe that's mirror imaging, but um, get rid of all your assumptions, challenge your assumptions, and and just realize that um, you know they're they're using different tools. That's why I really like how this discussion has gone about um, maybe maybe the the way to win the game um, is not to play at all. That's that's a line from that old uh, that old movie. What was the name of that movie? Okay. That's right. Yeah. So just just be. Um, I would say three or four dimensional in your thinking in terms of um, the threat, um, because unless you know about the threat, then how, how can we mitigate it? And that's gonna be a differentiator for your company. Um, I like to think about the vulnerabilities in terms of software and hardware, but don't forget about humanware. I may have to trademark that term. I did trademark the term insider trust. Um, you have to be more three dimensional in, in, your, in your thinking. So the humanware, what is that? That's um, the supply chain risk management of your people is the human supply chain. I'm so glad that was it you that mentioned that? Yeah. Right. This is What's the human supply chain? It's your employees, it's your vendors, right? There are people behind every one of these things. And right now they're stressed out. This is why um, two of my companies focus on um, the, the, the physical security piece is health security. To me, that's enterprise risk management. It's about the whole person. Um, if John um, coughs on me now, 
That's a security issue. Try if you coughed on me a year and a half ago, it's so you just coughed on me. Now I'm gonna, you know, run to the hospital and get a test. So um, the other company I have is, is uh, mental health uh, and resilience training, okay? Your employees are stressed out. They're out on the end of a tether. Some of them may like it if they're introverts. They don't deserve to be out there. They still need some human interaction. The extroverts hate it. And um, there's some vulnerability there, along with the um, increasing reliance on IT, right? And so um, the humanware, whether they're your people or the folks involved in your, your, your vendors, et cetera, be very aware of that because that's where it all comes comes down um, to the uh, to, to mitigating threats. Um, I can I, I I wish I could give you a lot of examples of all of our operations against the Chinese and the Russians and our you know and our work with other services uh, et, cetera, et cetera. I can't really get into all those details, but again, I can say it doesn't really matter whether you put a Chinese label on it, the Chinese government, a Russian maybe maybe it's. Um, I hate to say it, but maybe it's uh, an Israeli operation masquerading as a, as a Russian operation. Maybe they put a little bit of Russian uh, code into the malware to make it look like it's something else. It's a very um, confusing and um, um, obscure world. But what you need to know is that it's there and you need to be focused on some of the subtleties and be able to identify it and to be able to mitigate the threats and be good for your business. And then you're playing your role as part of this larger um, apparatus where we're, we're trying to um, bring together the different um, parts of our industries so that we can do what we want to do as a country and do what we need to do. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. So now if you conceive of things in that way, you're enterprise risk leaders, you're not enterprise risk managers, even you're not security officers, you're enterprise risk leaders, because you remember Carl is the invisible threat or um, these, this class of people are the invisible threat. Um, I, I guess I can, I can leave it there. Um, I guess one, one last comment, and that is that um, the, crown jewel, the crown jewel discussion. Sometimes you're trying to protect the wrong thing, right? You need to know what are your crown jewels because if you try to protect everything, you're protecting nothing. So you probably can't protect everything. So when I got to Tesla, you know, we had a crown jewel exercise. And it turns out we were, we were pretty spot on, I thought. Um, later, about two months later, a, a gentleman approached me and he said, you know, there's, there's one thing here in our architecture we're not protecting. And I said, well, we already went through that, our, our team. And um, that's, that's not uh, what we need to worry about. And he showed me how we were wrong in that if you had access to this large body of data, you could actually characterize, you could get PII out of it. You could identify these are individuals' information and what it meant. So. Um, many companies don't even do the crown jewel exercise. Um, and uh, if it's risks, a risk to your business, if, you, if you're going to lose it, that's the crown jewel, obviously. You can't protect everything. But also think about what um, the, the uh, threat actors want. Maybe they want something that you don't think is a crown jewel, but you should protect it anyway, right? Because they want it and need it, and that's going to contribute to their, their program. So I think some of these um, new compliance criteria are forcing us to think more holistically, which is good. Um, but we need to, enterprise risk leaders, think about it in a strategic sense. We don't just check the boxes, even if the box checking is getting better, right? Think about um, what it is you need to protect and why, and then that puts you into this, this leadership role. And I, I think it makes it more likely that you get the contracts with the, the primes. I know I'm certainly trying to do it for my companies. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, what, what scares me going forward? Um, I don't like that term scared because, you know, we don't want to say that we're scared, but I'm, I'm concerned about the increasing attack surface because of the IoT devices. I've got this, I've got this, I've got my, my phone over there, I've got an external battery pack. Um, there's a whole new dimension that I think this room realizes is there that others are only now realizing. There's the, uh, not to get philosophical, but this kind of um, triangle of, uh, physical, spiritual, emotional, I missed the order, um, physical, mental, uh, emotional, and spiritual. There's another element there that no one usually has talked about. Now we know it's there, it's the digital. Why do I put it as a whole uh, uh, level of existence? Because there are people who spend um, huge portions of their lives now existing in that digital plane. And that is part of their, um, and their, their um, identity. 
And uh, if you don't think it is, talk to any kid who's been cyberbullied, and then you know a lot of them um, succumb to suicide, unfortunately. In the digital realm, and because we're converging in this way with all these IoT devices, the attack surface is exponentially increasing, which means we have to be even more on our game, right? And we have to, uh, with the assumption of compromise, um, think about it, it, not that it, it can't happen to me, it is happening to me. It is happening to me. Assumption of compromise means they're in there. Okay, so what do we do? Where, where could they be? Where are our crown jewels? How do we protect them? So let's just finish off with, and it is happening to me. Can you repeat after me? It is happening to me. I feel like this is a victim group and we're actually <laughs> coming to terms with the fact that we are being had, but it's okay. The assumption of compromise, it's okay. We know we can't keep everybody out of our network. Somebody's in there doing something. We protect what we need to protect. It's a process. This enterprise risk leadership is a process. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen like that. Change the way of thinking. And, um, you know, I, I think that we're all going in the right direction with these um, compliance regimes and uh, coming together with large companies, small companies, and the government. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. I didn't tell you about all the secret intelligence operations, but, um, you know, if you have questions about those, I'll give you a little tidbits on that. Or tell us the software, you can't tell Well, I'll get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right, who has questions? Who wants to learn more? Any thoughts, philosophy, comebacks, disagreements, agreements? Yes. What's your best story about Elon Musk? <laughs> <laughs> um, on the record here, uh, yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> so you can share. That I can share. My best story about Elon Musk that I can share. Um, well, let's see. Uh, there's so many things. I, th I think it's, um, I would do this at CIA, actually. Um, I remember the day at CIA when I, everybody came around the table and we're having a, an operational review and someone had worked a long time to prepare this thick packet, you know, and it's sitting there in front of all of us. And I knew that no one had read that. Thing. I said, you know, guys, we're just going to take five minutes. I want five minutes of silence. Let's read what this person wrote. And she was at the end of the table was going to present to us. And she looked at me and she's like, wow, oh, thank you. Because otherwise she's going to repeat everything that she wrote. Um, so. We, we did that quite a bit. There were a lot of, uh, and he had a large leadership team. So usually there were about 25 of us or so. And we all were direct reports to Elon, which, you know, from a span of control standpoint is probably not the best, but um, there were a lot of pregnant pauses and silences with a lot of critical thinking happening during those moments. And I think that's interesting um, when someone can allow for that space to happen without having to fill it with just, you know, stuff but um i've got a lot of other stories and you know we'll talk. yeah we can talk about it, yes. <laughs> we'll talk when we're not on stage. yeah from your days doing intelligence at the cia and your expertise in security and, and human intelligence did you find that people listen to you more for your expertise or listen to you less based on you mean after i left like right now yep um i think i'm uh let's see i i i'm I'm practical. I think people learn by the school of hard knocks, right? So they listen when something has already happened. And then hopefully it's not the worst thing in the world. And then they seek out advice and counsel, and then we'll do mitigating measures. If, as long as that first blow isn't a death blow, that, that's okay. It's better to learn through the mistakes of others. I guess that's one of the definitions of wisdom. But, you know, I, I myself in my personal life have <laughs> not been able to exemplify that necessarily all the time. Um, yeah, and uh, you know we are guilty of mirror imaging sometimes too as intelligence professionals. I think um, you know we're 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 victims or products of our age and our time. I, I went back to school at Georgetown. And I came out of that. I, I, I did my mid career master's program right before I retired. I think my bosses had no idea how old I was, and uh, <laughs> so they let me go. I came back at a couple of years, and then I, I retired and uh, came back with a completely different framework um, and mindset about. Um, threats and security. And I remember at Georgetown, we had blocks on demographics, health. And, and I went to the teacher after a couple of weeks and I was like, we're wasting our time. Where, where's the hardcore security stuff? He's like, Carl, you don't get it. The threats these days. And that's when the, the Arab Spring literally happened the next week. And it was a lot due to demographics and economic trends. Um, so I, I guess I'm just saying, take an old CIA guy, um, depending on their experience and what they do afterwards and their instance, it may or may not be helpful. I think people um, 
wise people take as much as they take in as much as they can, right? And I like to think that we have some things to teach, but we're not, um, you know, we don't know everything. Uh, but we have one thing I did realize after, and how many have been in government? A lot of you guys were military, done tour after tour after tour, hopping all over the place. When I kind of came out of that ecosystem, now I'm in private industry. Small business is where it's at with critical thinking, but the, the critical thinking you get in the government, you know, I mean, I prepared to go to so many different places that at the end of the day, bam, no, you got to go here now. Well, what are you talking about? I just spent six months preparing to go to this place. You know, I know all the cases. I even went over and I met foreign liaisons. No, we need you in this country now. You're constantly remaking yourself, constantly learning new things. And those skills, the critical thinking skills, are what make you a good enterprise risk leader um, and keep you on your toes. Um, so and you can see a lot of that, uh, see those same things I think about uh, small business, constantly on your toes. That's why I love it. It reminds me of the CIA. I think being, um, being an entrepreneur is the closest thing to what it's like to be a CIA operations officer because you're, you're, you have to solve these problems on the spot and things change dynamically and you just get thrown into something and you, you make it work. Any, any other questions? I hope that was useful. A little more ethereal than some of this, this other stuff, but I think we're on the right track here with uh, where the discussion is going. And uh, I'll be with you guys in the networking thing as well, just trying to figure out how to, how to get contracts and uh, <laughs> help us go where we need to go as a country. Thank you, Carl. I, I just wanted to make this one comment. Um, myself, um, I've come from the Intel community as well. Um, your thought process is dead on. Um, I don't think um, there's a lot of thinking um, or concept of, like yours out here that people really pay attention to. And I think that's why it's quiet, because um, it really makes you think. And because everyone thinks everything's so digital. But as someone, a, a, a mental, process behind that digital um, means that we are actually fighting against. So thank you for that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just remember that there, with, with, with this proliferation of IoT devices and the exponentially increasing attack surface, that's like Christmas for intelligence officers. And so on, on the one hand, it's kind of exciting because we can be on the offensive side of that as small companies as well and bring new capabilities to the government. But on the other, it's a little frightening in that there's this whole underworld that most people don't really think about or know of. So forewarned is forearmed. Thank you. Human element is the scariest part, right? And that's what it all comes down to. People are crazy. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Thanks. Thank you so much for being here. Five, you finally made it to that magical time of break. So we will give you 15 minutes of your life to check your emails, although nobody really cares. I promise the CIO and keyboard is still there when you're ready. Right? Right side? Uh, there are snacks out there. Get some coffee. That will put you that side. And we reconvene at 10.15 on the dot because we land the plane on time. The Zoom will stay on. And we'll come back. Yeah, Zoom is still on. Please don't pick your nose in front of them. Thank you. We're solidified.
Um, over 18,000 companies were impacted, including federal agencies, um, even some high profile uh, public companies uh, like Microsoft and Tone NVIDIA. Is Orion their product? Is it Orion Collections? Uh, so Orion Collections, it's, it's one of their applications within the SolarWinds. Um, but really, at a very high level, um, the, the idea here is that malware is injectable at the DevOps level, right? So when you're creating code in sort of the software development, development life cycle, it's very possible for uh, malicious code to be injected. And as you saw in SolarWinds, right, um, a lot of customers do not have a good understanding of what happens at the component level of their applications. Um, so this really brings us to, you know, what, what is an SBOM exactly? Um, currently in the market in both the industry and the federal space, there is no consensus of, you know, what is the structure of an SBOM, right? There's really right now only three major frameworks for this, uh, for a machine readable software bill of material. But um, at a very high level, there's really seven components of an SPOM here. Um, supplier name components, uh, all the way down to timestamp. Um, I don't want to go into detail here. I want to try to get us to the point of the exercise, which will help us get a better understanding of you know, uh, what, what SPOMs really mean in the real world. Um, you know, why, why does it matter, right? A lot of attackers are now going for the weakest link in the chain, primarily small businesses or um, you know, four party subprime vendors within supply chains. Um, and as John mentioned earlier, there's a lot of merger regulations about this. Um, mentioned eight months is when uh, we're going to start seeing a lot of um, organizations start to require SBOMs in their procurement process. Uh, for example, in the past year, we have seen some banks actually require a five to 10% reduction in the license costs. Uh, as a result of a vendor not being able to provide their software bill material. Is that on the commercial side or the government side? That's on the commercial side. Um, to my knowledge, I have not heard anything on the government side yet. Um, I get the impression that it's more yes, no, right? Like we you provide it, or if you don't, get out is more yes, John. I'm looking to both of you. Yeah, the, the short is it will be a binary for government, it will be a yes, no. Whereas on commercial, it's a way to uh, scam 10% off the cost. Well, exactly. And I think what you'll see is between primes and subs. The primes will say, give me the S bomb. And if you can't, they'll say, great discount. I'll make an S bomb for you. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay you a lot less than I would otherwise. All right. Money out of my pocket. I love it. Got it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, how do you actually generate an S bomb? There are some programmatic softwares out there that can generate SBOMs for you uh, by simply uploading your file into your applications. Um, you know, so selfishly speaking, Fortress does have one of those products. Um, but I think the challenge for that is that it's very hard to scale, right? Um, so typically how we see SBOM generation workflow in the industry is um, when it comes to procurement, right? They're looking at vendors to see if they can provide their SBOMs, right? If they can, great. If they can't, um, you would have to generate it manually. Uh, but the biggest challenge right now with regards to SBOMs is that there's so many players involved in the supply chain, right? You, you look at the any component that's being made, the subcomponents, and the vendors, manufacturers, and OEMs responsible for those components. It's really hard to track down the entire bill of material. Um, when it comes to these software and sometimes hardware IoT connected devices. Um, so that's sort of where the marketplace comes in, right? This ability for organizations such as market makers to be able to push down the pressure down to the vendor and for the vendors to push the pressure down to their subprimes. Um, so at Fortress, this is something that uh, we are developing. Um, and you know, something that we're interested in is getting more collaboration across the industry for uh, a lot of businesses and organizations, organizations that would be impacted. Um, so that being said, you know, I, I want to hop over into the actual um, exercise to help us get an understanding of what SBOMs look like um, in the real world. So. Okay, thanks. 
coming up to shift. All right, so everybody's still awake. I know we're going to try this and we're going to do it in real life. So for those of you on Zoom, you should see the actual exercise. You will have to talk to your dogs and your cats and see what they can do to help you out. For everybody else, Jeff, do you want to walk us through? And I think it probably makes sense to do it by row, right? I think so. Yes, I know you're going to have to talk to your neighbors. It's horrible. It's awful. Something new. Something new. It is something new. Right, Jack, walk us through this. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm just going to read this out loud. Uh, so in this activity, you will learn the challenges of software bill of materials through an interactive simulation. Right? You have you should have a note card in front of you. Everybody got note cards? We got it? We got it? John Apple? Yes. Yeah. So anybody else? All right. Come around, come around, hold on to it. Welcome. Don't wear any heels, you guys. <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys are doing it or not. Don't wear them. All right, everybody got it. Go for it. I guess so. I missed anybody? I missed All right. Now, welcome to the airport tech. We all have no cards. All right, does everyone have a note card? All right. Um, so instead of organizing the groups of five or six, um, we're going to do this by tables, I believe. I think that's right, the easiest, right? We'll right. have everybody. If you're in a table of three, uh, collaborate with the table behind you. If you're in a chair, uh, just join a table uh, in front of you. All right. So each member in your group will be responsible for designing a pizza. By listing the ingredients, right? Looking at your note card, right? Um, some of them would have a star on it. Right? Um, anyone have stars in here on their right. note card? Stars. There should yeah. be one per group. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, if you have a start your note card, congratulations, uh, you have allergies. Uh, however, you don't need to make a pizza, right? So, here are the instructions. Um, for anyone that's a star, if you have a start your note card, write down one pizza topping and keep your card hidden from everyone else, right? The ingredient you write is going to be your allergy. Now, for everyone else, you guys are pizza makers. So on your note card, craft a pizza with at least three of your favorite toppings. Right? Write, write down all the ingredients you need to make a pizza. And if you list pineapple, we're going to judge you. I just want you to know that. I'm putting that on. I'm putting that out. Like, there will be judgment. We will, it'll be our, yeah, I'm going to call you out. Another person in your row who's a teacher maker who has another note card. 
But if anyone is interested in learning more about SBOMs, you know, want white papers, um, kind of one on one guides, um, feel free to email uh, John or Francesca. John, come on up here. You're now on the hot seat. Uh, on the hot seat. I, literally, Jeff is going to get all those emails forwarded to him. <laughs> He's the smart guy. Like, so I think I, I think the thing maybe Jeff will point out, this is how you may consider explaining this to your client, right? And so your client, you, know, you want to cudgel your competitor, play this exercise with them. Uh, and again, most of your competitors will have, you know, no clue about this because the requirement remains the same. And again, I'm always thinking about how am I going to make money on this, right? If it's a small business, this is how you're going to make money on it. This is also where the vulnerability is, is if you've already given them stuff that's poison. Uh, and unfortunately, most of us have inadvertently done that because uh, you pulled something from GitHub. So those those are the things I focus on. For sure, Jeff will be getting those emails, uh, but I'm happy to supply the white papers and all these other things. It's a hot, hotly evolving subject. Uh, any, any questions on S bombs? So how are you protecting the S bomb self? Yeah, good question. Um, so it, it really depends on the organization because when you have an S bomb. That's also, you're also able to kind of mess with the authenticity and integrity of this. So one thing that we're building on Fortress is a blockchain enabled solution. Um, essentially what that means is uh, they're non-fungible, right? So you, you can't change the record in the chain unless over 50% plus one of all the nodes in the chain agree to the change. Right? So you could be a hacker, make your way in and say, hey, hey I'm going to change this S bomb, right? Um, it, it won't get accepted by our system. So the customer has to be part of the blockchain. Yes, so it's, it's going to be an industry move um, from the market makers down to the smallest stack in the OEM. How much is this going to cost? So you just look at me, the truth is that the market's going to supply like anything else. What we are predicting is going to happen is your big market makers, your primes, are going to, they're going to choose one of several marketplaces of choice, and then they're going to essentially send you. For, we're not the only ones who are using blockchain for this. Unisys, some of the others are. Pretty, blockchain is clearly the answer here. Uh, I agree. Yeah. That, so what's going to happen is they're going to send you a request. Yeah, they're, they're going to send you a request for that S bomb, and you should be able to put it into that into that request form. It will then be encrypted and then shared by the blockchain, and then you'll say, "Hey, I'm going to let you send this forward two times. So once to the government, and once to I don't know, somebody else in the government." So in terms of raw cost market, we'll decide. We're predicting that this will be relatively inexpensive. Um, and so on the order of hundreds to like a thousand dollars to play the game. Uh, I know some of the other some of the other market makers want you know like a Lamborghini to play the game. Um, but so really, I think it'll be market driven. We don't know what the whole market will be. So um, this brings up a lot of questions for me. Um, so. Please bear with me. in. <laughs> All right, guys. Speak loud, though, please. Okay. The S bomb, I think, is a very good, I, I, wonderful idea. And especially if you can uh, add the blockchain um, to help, help protect it somehow. Or, um, but my question is who, who's the, who are you going to purchase? Who's going to be the um, individual within the agency you're going to pitch this to? And the reason I'm asking, uh, as we know, security is from agency. In, is never ending, included in acquisitions as well in procurement. You also, on the other side, on the CIS, CISO side, um, have the ATO authorization. So currently within the ATO process, they have an unofficially a bomb. And I'm just trying to figure out how would you leverage I know how you would leverage it, but who would you leverage it to? Because it needs to come together within procurement as well as during the ATO process, um, whenever there's a new system being stood up, that's all. I'll answer in DOD vernacular because that's an easy one. Jeff and I can take that one. He's the commercial builder guy. I'm the guy with the barrels. So the same folks who are asking for your ATO information are going to be ones requesting this, right? If you follow the DOD, they used to be DiCap. Everybody now knows there's RMF. That phase six, which is you know not actually done today. This is how they're going to execute phase six of your RMF. This is how they're going to continuously monitor. So they're going to jam these S bombs into a system, right? There'll be a huge market. There's already a growing market for this of companies who can do it. 
right? And they're going to continuously monitor those components for vulnerability. That so either prior to the acquisition, somebody's going to come asking, or just after they're going to say, okay, great, as part of the acquisition, you now have to deliver this. Deliverable one, give me your S bomb. And then they'll be using that on the ongoing basis. The big piece here is going to be patching, right? And so this is where S bombs get tricky, right? So I have my ingredients list, right? If we follow Pete's analogy, it's like, well, now I'm going to change some of the toppings because I decided I don't like pepperoni, right? Well, you've actually just created a whole a, a addendum to your initial S bomb. And that's where this is. Jeff talks about scalability. That's where this becomes very difficult. I mean, think about how many patches come out on daily. Yeah, daily. And that's why all these systems will have to be on. So, and that's why we, we've, like many others, have concluded it'll be marketplace driven because otherwise there's no other efficient way of scaling. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. What other questions do we have? Well, I have both of them up here. So, one of the things that I think is interesting, especially for BD professionals in the room, I view this as what, you know, what Katie and I got excited for is this is how you ghost your competition and your proposal. I mean, every government agency wants to hear lower risk, lower risk, lower risk, right? So if I can show my S bomb not necessarily right here in, in the actual RFP response, but at least a you can find it here, or you take the proactive stance that it's available, it's ready, you feel good about it, blah, blah, blah. Well, that just asked me in source selection, well, what is the competition doing? Well, you said this, but these other guys did, whether they asked for it or not, right? So I think it becomes, and I think John hit on this earlier, it becomes a differentiator. And it becomes a differentiator for a smallish window of time, right? A couple of years, probably, until everybody gets on board and then it no longer is, you know, shiny and new. Um, and it just becomes like running your D and B, right? Like, oh, all right, just run the system in the marketplace. We're good, right? So I think it, that's where they're trying to head towards. And that's where it makes sense to me. But I feel like for the BD professionals, this is where you start ghosting. This is where you deter risk on your competition. This is where you talk about your strengths. And this is potentially a very big win. Because even our large system integrators who are in the room are gonna tell you, they're gonna be, they're forced to take it seriously, which means they are going to force their subcontractors to take it seriously. And I'm sorry, but a lot of us, I mean, you can't meet this, yes, no, you're out. Right, like you're off the team, you're off the thing, you're out of there, and we'll replace you. Sadly, small businesses sometimes viewed as completely replaceable. So, and an element of teaming, and an element, you know, which obviously with government we do a lot of teaming for folks, right? So, an element of teaming, element of win themes, element of PD. I know we're telling you all of this right after everybody finished writing all the things. <laughs> Hopefully, you only have a couple more proposals left, but I think this is what you guys. I think it's a great strategy for the fall of next year. All right, what are we missing? Does Fortress uh, maintain and develop this blockchain? Yeah, so we, we do, but there's others in the market. Like, so not, it's not a Fortress. Like they're, the market has concluded that this was going to happen. So sort of everybody now has their, their flavor. And Jeff mentioned banking. So really where this came from was the energy sector, the banking sector. So uh, you have companies that have been doing this in banking for a while, and now we, we have to come from the energy generation field. And so in that field, if you get caught with an asset that's out of spec, you pay a million dollars per day per asset. And so people take it super seriously. Um, and then so basically everybody there has concluded the same thing. So the government's actually late to this, as usual. Uh, banking and, and energy got there first, and that's, that's why we know them. Basically, everybody's maintaining their own blockchain. Some of those blockchains share with the client. So client has a node. Some of them are completely proprietary. Some of them are built on things like Ethereum, uh, if you if you follow the market blockchain. So there's no standardization as of yet, just like SD1. Uh, NTIA came out with the preliminary standard based on the executive order two, two, two and a half weeks ago. Okay. Uh, that will go over to NIST and be finalized and introduced into the FAR. This is why I say eight months. That's that's the date. Okay. And is NIST responsible for the standardization yeah, policy? Yeah, yeah. So just for, for all education, right. and sorry if I'm not as far as on this, but so NIST will be the governing body, or at least the, the yes. people who are giving us the standardized list, right? Yeah. So the people who own CMMC are now going to put this out. 
Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. Just those combination of things. Yeah. Um, and so it should be super self explanatory and super easy, I'm sure, right? The, the, because that's how these things go. In fact, if you go back to just PowerPoint on this, right, the actual ingredients list for this is pretty straightforward. It's a matter of generating it. That's complex. Um, because if you have, right, yeah, 10,000, yeah, and so supplier name, component name, like that, you know, we're talking about seven factors, not a lot of stuff there. But when you have 10,000 or 100,000 components, all of a sudden that becomes that's where the complexity comes. Um, and so the format's fairly straightforward. It's the executing that's the dog. So I can only imagine as a large system integrator. Yeah, that's so if you think about like so we'll pick a company, say you're thinking Terry, right? You're building the, the Navy's two new frigates. Uh, on that ship, you figure there's 30,000 sub suppliers. Airbus, for example, uses about 200, 210,000 sub, sub suppliers for their planes. We talked to their CISO two weeks ago. So that's, that's the rough order of magnitude. You figure each company is going to be supplying them an S bomb. So that has thousands of parts. So you, you guys can do the math quicker than I can. Uh, yeah, they're going to ask, it's going to be, there's complexity here, but that's, that is why we, it's going to have to be. Sort of market driven, everybody put out, I would probably sound repetitive, but everybody puts in a little bit, and that's how you're going to get the outcome. Um, and then ultimately, uh, ultimately, they're going to have to do it. There is no other way of continuously monitoring and securing the software supply chain. Right? So you heard Chris Cleary in the beginning talk about DevSecOps, right? Like you can, I, you can ask somebody until they're blue in the face, are they secure? They're going to answer yes every time, right? But then the show me, this is the show me that we haven't had to be in the market. And I think our, our next conversation will be the ramifications of not showing or lying. <laughs> so, and we will chat about that. You said that the, basically, uh, from working in relation to the blockchain, you're going to the list of components that are detrimental across the industry, and you're going to have to maintain them. It's like, like updating your uh, anti fire software, right? So, That's all the updates and stuff that yeah. everybody would be across the board. So, no matter what blockchain is being used, you know, it's the same directory of. Yeah, that's 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 our approach to it. Okay. Uh, other folks are taking different approaches, but basically, yeah. And so it's like, hey, don't use pepperoni from this vendor. It's bad. And everybody that's associated to your subscription or something has that, that same thing. Right, and then there'll be other companies who have. I mean, there's be clear, we're not the only ones. We just yeah. we have that expertise in this. There's going to be 10, 20 of these guys all out there playing the same game. Yeah. John, what's the time frame? So. We're talking a lot of different technologies here that have come together and work precisely. So I think we understand or we know kind of CMMC is about that five ish so yeah. years away. So this is a little different. How much time do you have? Uh, you know, it depends on your position in the market. And so if you're a company that just, you know, kind of does butts and chairs and you, you do policy stuff, this is probably a wait for you. If you're a technology company, you guys work in tech, this is a do right now, not because there's a regulatory, like if I, and you have eight months, right? But it's do right now because it's the biggest competitive advantage, right? And so everybody who's, everybody who's bid on a system in the government, we've all had to fill out our risk mitigation plans, our DevSecOps plans, right? They're like 80 pages long for our QSAF, right? Everybody's done that. If yours says, hey, I can supply and maintain SPOM, you win, they lose. Because the people, in cyber, they get, they get, I already get it. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm doing, and I'm making sure I have the relevant capabilities to deliver on that. But again, as we get back to cost up front, cost past the client, like I'm always a fan, like cost past the client. Um, that's how I would approach it. Have you heard any talk on S bombs for cloud solutions, co location? Because once you get out to that network um, infrastructure build out, there's a lot of products out there. Uh, a lot of products out there that, so there is going to be some i think right now they've made something that's universal they feel is universally applicable i feel like your big cloud providers are going to require some uh, additional regulations they just haven't come out yet. they're still in like the crawl let's figure out where the edge cases are that's an obvious edge case they just haven't gotten there because even the old infrastructure legacy and and current uh, when you talk about the fiber optic networks those telecom companies have a slew of vendors. Oh, totally. That's so, and we, we do this already in looking for vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities are consistent, okay. right? And so China loves to get at switches, yes. right? Physical devices, they love switches, they love routers. Like if they're gonna poison something, you're like, hell yeah, we got your switch. 
on the software side, it's consistently things like DLLs, right? But so it's that it's that component that your programmer got lazy pulled from GitHub. That's always it, right? And if it's not Chinese, it's Russian. How often have we found right components that are written in Cyrillic? Right? When you look at the dev notes, it's like mm, I don't know if I like that. So that, those are the consistent places. And what we think will happen is that the availability of quality components will expand. It'll be a contraction and those type of things because the market will be. Okay. Yeah, it's back up. Is Fortress um, concerned about the code that they may be asked to provide? If, if so, well, that's a, we eat our own medicine, right? So we provide our own, right? If you want to say, hey, as secure, we, we, we can already do that. Right? Um, in fact, we, as, as a principle, we don't work with companies that don't look at their supply chain. We just won't do business with them. Um, we're 100% of our vendors with their same review. Government. So we're ahead, but that's our business, right? I wouldn't expect a, a small business to be there yet, but I do. And, and to be clear, right, there's a bunch of other companies trying to do much of the same stuff. The difference I would say is that some of those companies are looking in Fed, some of those companies are looking in banking, some of those companies are looking in different uh, different industries. And Fortress is focused on federal contracts. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's UD. Specifically, yeah, beginning. yeah, DOD is the big mover here because they're the largest acquirers, right? They're also the primary target. It isn't that China doesn't want to hack the Department of Interior, but they do, right? Um, but you know, between taking out an aircraft carrier and dealing with oil land rights, they prefer the carrier. Makes sense. All right, Meg had a question on the Google Drive. Yes, Zoom question came out a little background there. NASA is one of the WWCM's customers that have started a large conversation. Regarding the impacts of solar wind. At the DevOps level, they assist a program at NASA with what happens at the component level with FBOPs. So the question is what is the biggest challenge Fortress has experienced with getting collaboration across the industry with regard to obtaining the details of that? Yeah, so this is interesting. You have companies that don't want to play. They're like, oh, we're not giving it to you. And that, and I get it, right? And so, but it's funny because if, if you had asked six months ago, uh, solar winds to give you an S bomb, uh, they would have given you the high sign and maybe some four letter ones. Uh, today, ask them, and I promise you they will deliver an S bomb. I promise you they will deliver. Uh, and we know that for a fact. We know from some of the bigs that they are now asking, and solar winds delivers it. But, but that is the heart of the issue. People don't want to give them the goods. That's going to change because it's going to be market trip. Right? The client is not going to buy if you don't supply it. Uh, so the people who supply it will win much more. So isn't this as proprietary as your indirect rates, your French? Your, I mean, is that the same your, logic, right? Yeah, yeah. So your my S bomb is the same as my interest. My that's rates. A hundred percent right. You're you're looking at the same. In fact, if you follow CUI, this is technical CUI, right? Yeah. And then vice financial CUI. That's that's why you have to protect. Yeah, but but same family tree. Same family tree. So in my mind, I'm like, ask me for an S bomb. What I upload it via the marketplace, like. And in theory, only the people that I have authorized can see it, much like a sealed bid package yeah. in your pricing strategy, in your pricing volume. Right. And Correct. Exactly right. And that's the one that I think we mentioned this earlier. Like, don't email your S bombs. <laughs> right. Well, right. especially right. using <laughs> arrows.com. Yeah. You know, that's another yeah, yeah, reference. That's, but that's okay. That's the same thing because when I give it, when you give up your financial information, right, the worst thing that happens is like you lose competition. That's not great, but it's not the end of the world. People can use them to do some trading on it. Uh, but when you give this up, you might literally be giving the bad guys the map to how to blow you up. So a little bit different of a uh, uh, security. Yeah, a little bit different. Okay. And where do you see this rolling out kind of first? You say DRD, but like is there yeah, a specific a, agency there, that you think can? there has never been equity in how and how DOD policies are rolled out, right? And and if you actually go through and read these, there's not gonna be Right, but so the the companies who are developing high end systems are going to get this first. So you're working on a weapon system, you're working in classified space, you're going to see this. You do satellites, you're going to see this. You do drones, counter UAS, you're going to see this. If you do pencils, six or seven years. Uh, yeah, it's behind. Yeah, yeah, but but that's that's any it, the, basically, and this is to our point on you know the people in this room do the innovation. If you're in, if you're an innovator, you're going to be first up. Right, you're you're the ones, and you actually go into the policies and read them. Actually, articulate who's high risk and who's not. Okay. What about? Um, all right, I'll just say my bias. The IC, the wild, wild west, where there are no rules and mythical budgets that just happen out of nowhere. 
Same, it'll be the same there. Can it flow through? Yeah. Are we going to see it there? It'll be the same there. Yeah, it'll be the same there. But you have to look at in relative terms. I see as big as it is, buys relatively fewer things. And they also already applied internally a lot of the security. So like if you go to an NSA cloud center, they're already doing a lot of this stuff. They've already had internal mechanisms. If you go to a DOD example of that, they've taken attestations. So they've taken promises from people who took promises from China who smiled and promised. Uh, and, and that's that's the primary difference. What could go wrong? Nothing. Nothing could go wrong. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Anything else you guys want to play stump to chump with these guys? Get them. <laughs> Get the smart people. <laughs> Any other discussion? Any? Anything? Good if we're good. Again, we're driving this plane. We're going to be way on time. All right. I will give you guys two seconds and then we're going to get Sai up here. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate it. Anyone thinking about pizza? Um, okay, maybe that's just me. Barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> but barbecue, I can see barbecue being set up in the background, which is awesome. So it is here. That's the best news. Food will be here. You know what? I'm doing this conference. I'm a right. Yeah. I just said I do this conference. It's good. Barbecue and beer. Are you the grill master? I am not. I am actually all right. So as we're Switching. I am actually a certified Kansas City barbecue judge. Oh. I am a KCB certified barbecue judge. Back in the day, there was barbecue competition. So, okay, side so note. Sorry, so I'm going to talk about somebody here from the DC bar. I'm actually prohibited from saying I'm an expert at something under the ethics rules. <laughs> State Department and Commodity Futures Trading Commission, dealing with some of the Enron stuff. So I've 
been around federal government issues. My parents worked at the State Department, not that that gives me any sort of qualifications, but um, I've just been around this town, grew up around here, and I've been doing this for a pretty long time at this point. So you just know a little then, right? I know a little bit. Yeah, I know. I know a little bit. I know a little bit. I know some stuff about it, some things. <laughs> and this particular topic, um, I sort of was drafted in a few years ago because everybody knows, I, uh, at least the firm, that I just built my own computer since I was a kid. And so they're like, well, you built computers. You must know this <laughs> stuff. So I said, well, you know, I think <laughs> I'm not a software guy, but okay, fine. Um, so that's, I've, I've been learning all these things, dealing with data rights issues, and I see connection. I'll get into that in a minute. Okay. So, and you don't want to talk about CIOS because... <laughs> I don't want to talk about CIOS. I'm happy later, but not right now. But you need a beer in your hand. Right, right. Okay, cool. Totally all right. good. All right. Not <laughs> <laughs> <Back> too late. <laughs> all the things, all the things. All right, so let's go with a couple softballs here, and then I'm going to really press you on not giving me the answer, which I hate, which is it depends, which is what every lawyer tells you and then charges you $600 to tell you them. <laughs> Sorry, I might be biased. Sorry. All right, so let's talk about this executive order and what this means. So John scared us with it happens in less than a pregnancy, which is apparently a time frame for some people as they track time. I don't know what's going on there, but that it's coming out, right? So we had our executive order. It's going to flow into FAR. Tell me what we should be prepared for. Tell me, probably because you're a lawyer, this is where we bring you in. Tell us the bad stuff. Tell us how bad. How, what if we kind of just look the other way? What if we, you know, Sign off and just say it's fine. Yeah, and that's where I think, as, as we said, probably eight months um, is when things will really start happening. However, in 60 days from the executive order, which already happened, which I think is what we were talking about like about two weeks ago, NIST and everyone was getting into figuring out what the requirements were going to be and giving that to the FAR Council and other people. And then 60 days after that, which is going to be mid September, is whenever they're supposed to come out with something public that we could then sort of key off of. And I've been looking at this a lot like the 889 stuff, which is the, the John McCain we were talking about earlier with prohibiting certain Chinese telecommunications equipment and whatnot. All right, so 889 is the telecom piece, right? Just right. for everybody's awareness to make sure we're all on the same page. Go ahead. 889 is all that stuff. And if you take that as sort of a roadmap, I think there's a good possibility that it's going to be something like that, where you had the law come out, in this case it was the executive order, then you had some draft guidance come out, then when the final guidance came out, it's like, look, a year from then was whenever the first piece, the part A, came into, into effect, which is you can't sell this stuff to the government because it's prohibited equipment. Then a year after that, is whenever the real problematic piece came out, which says you can't use any of this Chinese telecommunications or the certain equipment, right? Or services. And that kind of caught everybody by surprise. So I'm glad people are here and paying attention now because I was somewhat shocked when we got all these calls and it was August 13th, 2020 is when that part B went into effect. We got all these calls at the end of August saying, what is this? It's like, what, what is this mod? Why am I doing this? What does this mean? It's like, well, you were supposed to be compliant two weeks ago. And by the way, this came out two years ago. So it's like, you know, I got stuff to do. Like, I don't have time to read all your FAR things. So, I mean, you went the FAR. Um, so honestly, the industry is asleep. Yes, and that, that's, I think what's happening right now, and you've heard it throughout today, is that no one's really sure how this is going to be implemented and what's going to happen. But most likely, they're going to say, look, you got to give us the software bill of materials for everything. Like we said, it's going to be a light switch. Yep. You either, you either have it or you don't. Very similar to the 889 stuff. However, also similar to the 889 stuff, you're going to have a lot of people that throw things together. And your, your software bill of materials is going to be incomplete. I can almost guarantee that there's going to be a number of people who submit incomplete SBOMs, okay? And what you need to know, and it was alluded to, is that that could be a false claim under the False Claims Act, right? False claim, false claim, false claim. And the 
there's all of you should be alarmed. Th there's two main <laughs> things to that, right? You either did it knowingly or you did it with reckless disregard for the truth. Okay. Most people don't do things knowingly. You know what I mean? Unless you're kind of a bad unless actor. You're or, unless you're, yeah. <laughs> all right, you're doing things on purpose. That's you usually don't do that. No right? government would ever do that. Never, 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 never. However, reckless disregard for the truth is really what the Department of Justice loves. Because yes. it's, what does that even mean? <laughs> I don't know. Okay? So what does it mean to have reckless disregard for the truth? Well, a lot of times, if it's something that has like a complex regulation, like take PPP stuff or take the small business rules and things like that that are really amorphous, what they try to get into is, well, what did you actually do on a case-by-case -case basis? What did you dig into? So in this sort of circumstance for your SBOM, what did you do to make sure everything was listed on there? What steps did you take? Did you go through and audit everything, all the software that you're using? Did you talk to your IT people, if they're inside your company? If you have outside vendors, did you talk to them? And this is where the lines, it's, I'm curious what's going to come out in a, in a month from now, in September, and then kind of tracking this for that whole eight-month period. And everyone's got to pay attention to it to see, well, where is that line going to be drawn? Because if they say you have to go down to like 889, it said everything in your possession. So what does that mean? Is it in my possession if it's like my internet service provider, like Verizon? Or is it in my possession if I use a third-party IT vendor for my cloud services? Do I have to check the hardware that they're using? And in this case, is do I have to check the, the software that they're using that my systems are relied upon because I'm technically using their systems to do my work for the federal government. So how far down that chain is it going to go where you have to go get a software bill of materials from everyone? And then you got to pass that liability down, which is what the big prime contractors love. Okay. So what they're going to do, if you're a sub, is they're going to pass down in the contract something that says, you swear to me that this is all accurate, 100%, and that if it's not, you're going to indemnify it. And then if something comes to light and they think there's an inaccuracy there, the law may require them, probably will, if you take the 889 model, will require them to report it and make a mandatory disclosure, which will then trigger an investigation and they will pass the buck to you. I've represented a number of subcontractors who did something wrong, be it billing, small business, whatever, incorrectly, and the prime contractor found out about it, reported it to the IG's office, and now the IG's breathing down their back. While the IG's breathing down their back and we're doing document review and trying to go through and see, well, was there actually a violation? What are our arguments that it was not reckless disregard, that it was just negligence maybe? Because if it's just negligence, you're off the hook technically. So where- think I was stupid. You can go with stupid. You can totally go with stupid. Right. We're good. And okay. so if okay. you just say, I was stupid, the problem is that you're so stupid that you didn't even pay attention. That's whatever the DOJ says, reckless disregard for the truth. So if you can't show that you went to things like this and you can't show that you tried to look at it, you have your executive order and your FAR clause and it doesn't have any notes in the margins, that's the kind of stuff that DOJ will say, you didn't even try Where's the evidence of all this? And, or, hey, I talked to a lawyer about this and they told me X. Like, you tried to go through this, or even your internal people. It doesn't have to be, you know, some formal thing. But if you have none of that, that's when you're going to get in trouble. And if you have a situation where you didn't include it, our prime is probably going to take your money and say, well, okay, these, these next like two invoices or three invoices or four or whatever, I'm withholding that because I don't know what's gonna happen here and you just put me at risk. And if the government comes after me, I wanna make sure I'm covered, almost like an escrow. That's what happens almost every time. So now you're in a situation where you don't have money coming in, at least for a few months until you kind of catch up and then it becomes couch money and it goes on long enough. Um, you don't have money coming in and you've got money going out and all your people are distracted because people like me, are calling and talking to your technical team 
about, hey, I need a bunch more information on this software. Or, hey, I saw this email where you talked about using this particular thing. Why is that not listed? Can you explain it to me? And I keep finding that every day I'm looking at things and every day I'm distracting your people because we have to do it and I'm interviewing them. And it's just a mess. And you're the one doing it, right? Or you or yes, the firm. Yes. Oh, and you're legal costs. Sorry. Right. <laughs> it's expensive. But the thing is, you do it internally, right? That's all discovery. Because there's no attorney client privilege. So that's why you lawyer up for everybody in the room as a risk reduction so that whatever you do find is not suddenly, you know, talking amongst yourselves is dangerous some days. But if I bring you in, I gotta pay you. Some way you you like to get paid. It's annoying. Yes, it is it is annoying. It's super annoying. I'm happy to talk to people sometimes or nothing, but if the real issue is if, let's say you're communicating before before you call anyone. Okay, before you call a lawyer, there's some emails that go back and forth, the oh shit email, right? Yep. Like, we just realized this thing wasn't in here. And then Bob is like, yeah, but we only use that little thing for this piece of the component and it doesn't really matter, don't worry about it. So, okay, I won't worry about it. Well, that stuff oh, is not in privileged. Writing. In writing. Yeah, in writing. And I, get to, I see that stuff all the time. So. Sign in all the dirty secrets, you guys. <laughs> you have a lot of <laughs> so so if you if you start to suspect something happened just stop right stop you can call people hopefully your phone's not bugged you can call people and you can explain talk people with the phone call your attorney or whoever you have hopefully um don't this is another thing I think. be careful talking to consultants because there's no privilege for a consultant so consultants are great for a whole lot of but when you're talking about a potential violation of law or regulation, you want to take a step back, maybe get some people in the conference room, have your OSHA conversation, and then call a lawyer and make all those communications, privileged communications about what exactly happened. Because I think what these, what the S bonds or the new rules that are going to come out are going to say is that there's going to be some sort of mandatory disclosure requirement. And if there's a breach, the executive order says right in there, you have three days to report it. So you have three days to report it. Once you learn about it, the prime, if you're, if you're a sub, the prime's gonna pass that down. With 889, it was one day to report and then 10 days to tell us your whole life story about how you did such a bad job and why it happened. I can almost guarantee there's gonna be something like that in here, a mandatory reporting requirement like that, aside from the FAR standard mandatory reporting. There's going to be something particular in this that if there's an attack or if you discover some violation or something missing, you have to tell us right away. If who am I telling? My prime? My, my end customer? Who do I tell? Is there a hotline number? What am I telling? Who am I telling? So the way the rest of these laws work is you got to tell the contracting officer. And any oh, no time you communicate, right, it's with the contracting officer because any other communication is, count. doesn't count. Okay. And if somebody tells you, if you call up your contract specialist and you're like, hey, this one little piece I left off my S bomb, do I really need to amend it? And they're like, ah, I don't know, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, you can't stop the government, which is you can't um, rely upon this. You can't say, well, government, DOJ, I talked to the contract specialist and they told me, don't worry about it. That doesn't matter. Talking to contract specialist isn't legally relevant. Now, will they maybe be lenient if it's something? Probably. But unless you're talking to the contracting officer, the government is not bound by anything they tell you. You can talk to the secretary, you can talk to the president. And unless the contracting officer on your contract is the only one who can really bind the government. In so, writing. In writing, uh, preferably. I mean, if you can get, it, or if they tell you something on the phone, do a memo to the file in contemporaneously. Um, so I had never thought about that, but you're right. The president can't do anything, <laughs> but if he absolves you of all your sins, um, because he's not the contracting officer. So the contract nerds are important, guys. <laughs> That's the takeaway there. Um, okay, sorry. Um, so that I think that that is the main piece of this is being aware of what's going into these certifications that you're making and paying as careful attention as you can down this chain of personnel or of equipment, things that, things that you're using and 
keeping a close eye on what these regulations say, because again, you're going to have to you're going to have to go down the chain. You're going to have to report most likely everything that, that you're using. Um, my hope is that they talked about some of these blockchain services and where things are going to be uploaded and automatically checked. Potentially down the road, these systems will be secure enough and used enough where then maybe one of these companies says, look, I've got this certification. You know, it's sort of like a CMMI or an ISO thing or whatever, where they say, hey, you ran everything through my system or this subset of 10 systems that we approved. And we know that we trust that those systems are checking appropriately. And everything you put in there is fine. So show us that certification and then you don't need to give us the entire s -bar. That's not what's in there right now, but because of all these risks we talked about with right. handing over all the specific information, I think at some point that's going to occur where they're going to potentially, especially prime contractors, if you're not in this direct chain where you are providing, your, say you're developing software that you're giving to the prime, which is being incorporated into some major item being given to the government. In that case, you're probably always going to have to provide everything. But at some point in the future, you, if you're an ancillary player, you might be able to get away from that a little bit, but not right now. So that's more speculation about, about the future. About how it will be implemented. Right. And what that looks like in the marketplace. Yeah. All right. False claim tag. So, how, bad, how bad is that? Do we get handcuffs? Like, what happens? <laughs> there's actually there's a criminal and there's a civil false claim. So there, there's a poll. The Criminal False Claims Act is used very rarely. Um, I do a number of false claim act defense work cases, and even the ones that I have going on right now that started criminal have moved just to civil. Um, so most of the time, you don't you don't really have to worry about handcuffs. Um, All right. Well, that's a good. All right. That's some positive news. Yeah, it's positive. It's good to um, get positive news out of a lawyer. All right. Fine. I, I now I most of the time. No, you don't. Lawyers never have positive news. Doing them on everything depends. But go ahead. It's, it's kind of true. Hopefully, right? Hopefully that doesn't happen. And then when you get into the civil false claims realm, what usually happens is you're going to end up getting either a subpoena from probably an IG's office. Sometimes it comes directly from the Department of Justice. But how does that stuff even happen, right? Well. Usually it's some disgruntled employee that starts that whole chain. Uh, that I think is the biggest thing also is that people are going to hear all about this. this. This has already gotten a lot of play. I mean, we're sitting here in this room, right? This has already gotten a lot of play. Um, anyone who's in the federal space, especially people in sort of your IT departments, things like that are going to know what some of these requirements are. And you should have some sort of internal reporting process on this. So if someone sees the s bombers helping put it together and that they realize that something's missing that they should report it internally so then you can correct it because if you if it's like one piece of software or a couple of things that you left off your list and you report it and you fix it that's probably the end i don't think you're going to go much much farther but if you don't do that and you have no sort of internal reporting process and then what happens is it's only after you get the subpoena that you're like, oh my gosh, we did leave something off. I guess we should do something. We about should that. do something, right. And even if you're in the process of doing some internal investigation to determine like what happened, or if there, were, if there was some breach, and you're like, well, I don't know what was really breached, so I'm not gonna tell anybody yet. And the rule says I have to do it within three days. It's been five, but I, I haven't really dug in to exactly what that breach was. Um, if you're taking that kind of track, that can be problematic. So you need to jump on it right away. So as soon as there's a breach, if you need to do an internal investigation as to what happened, do it immediately. And then when you report it, report it in such a way that minimizes the, the risk, right? So you're saying, look, there was, there was this breach. It wasn't a big deal. It only compromised this piece, or it was this we found out this one piece of software that we used that was on some GitHub library that it was compromised, that it's only used in this little piece and we've removed it from, from our software base. We're not using it anymore. Here, here's your report. What you don't wanna do is simply say, oh, hey, it's day three. 
by the way, we had some breach. We don't know what happened. We don't know how, why, what it, what it compromised, but we have to tell you, so we're telling you. Um, that's, that's the stuff where someone's gonna freak out inside the government. And if you're, in the, if you're in this process of doing this evaluation and you're trying your best to move as fast as you can, and then you get a knock on the door, knock on the door, you get like a subpoena or something. Generally speaking, the government, DOD or the IG's office, um, they are not going to treat you as a good actor. They're going to assume you're a bad actor because they didn't hear from you until you heard from them. And that's one of the biggest things. I'm dealing with a case right now where we were doing an internal investigation. We had to get an accountant involved because it was a pricing issue. And they were pouring through tons and tons and tons of data, which takes time. And we didn't get around to reporting, to actually doing the memo yet because we were waiting on the accounting folks. And we got the subpoena. And so now we're in this process of explaining to, it was the IG and then it got referred to the Department of Justice. We're talking to the Department of Justice now about how, no guys, we swear we were doing this. Here's this information that we were trying to investigate. We were about to tell you before you dropped this thing on us. And ideally you don't want to be in that situation. So having some procedures now to find violations, report violations internally, ideally, and then report up to your, your, your in-house counsel, which can be squirrely sometimes, or your outside counsel, ideally, for privilege reasons, and then having that discussion and doing that investigation. Sometimes the investigation could just be a phone call. I mean, I've done things in the past where I've talked to people about specifically certain cyber breaches, in fact, and said, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't fit the definition because you didn't really have CUI here. So you're there, I can't say 100%, but I can say you got pretty low risk. So if you don't want to report it for a business reason, then you could probably not report it and there's low risk. If someone says something, we've got all these arguments as to why it, it wasn't a compromise issue. And that's the kind of analysis I think, depending on what comes out in these regulations, um, hopefully in a month and then definitely in that eight, eight month period to look at it and say, well, what exactly does it say? Does it have some requirement that you only have to report things if you did something um, knowingly or with reckless disregard? Because then there's a whole analysis about, well, were you just negligent? Or were you, were you reckless? Where, where were we? What's the best argument we can make? Because most of the time people who call don't want to report. Nobody wants to report. Nobody wants to report. Nobody wants to report. And especially if you look at 1089 and, and analogize to that, in that 10-day period for the 889, if you discover you're using this equipment, you have to tell them what you tried to do to prevent use to begin with, how this how this happened, and how you're remediating, you're remediating the situation. And I think that's going to be the same type of process that's gonna to have to happen here. So you're forced to tell on yourself. So as you're telling on yourself, you gotta make sure you have a good story and you've done the proper analysis and you don't want one report to be what you're saying internally and what's going out to the government. Because the internal report and what you're doing for your company, you probably wanna be more comprehensive and more blunt than what you're actually reporting to the government. And if you're doing this memo internally, again, that's all discoverable. So if you have a memo and you're doing it yourself, that, that's where what we usually do is we'll come in and do this investigation. We'll do one memo for the company and say, here's like the real unadulterated, right? You're in, this, this stuff was not great. Now we have to report here's it, suck. but here's what we're gonna say publicly. And that's the kind of process you want to go through to make sure. Now, you can't hide information, right? You have to, whatever the law requires, but you don't want to necessarily do more than the law requires. That, that's why there's these two memos. It's like, I don't know if anyone's been deposed before. You've had the joy of having that happen to you. But what usually, you'll sit down with probably a lawyer, and they'll tell you, only ask the questions that are being asked of you. Like, don't elaborate. Don't go on some. Um, random big rant about something just yes no or the particular answer and if you don't know you know say say you don't know that's what people say when you're in a deposition 
Similarly, when you're over here, you only want to put down the information that's required by the law to be disclosed unless there's some mitigating factor that you think will make you look good. Explain. That's it. And you <laughs> don't want to go, you don't want to go into all this detail. You don't want to call. You definitely do not want to have someone from the organization call and apologize and explain <laughs> what happened. Because I've seen that happen before. All right, no apologies, guys. No apologies. It's, it's like in a car wreck, right? Don't get out and be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Um you know, like a lawyer. <laughs> You just you just want to say, hey, okay, name Rex, you're on the road. Let's let's got it. All that. right, I know we're winding down. Thank you. I feel like you might charge us for this after the hour. Sorry. It's all good advice though. I'm really glad that we all got that for free. Good job. Who any questions from anybody? No yeah. questions. You may charge. Hold on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you may charge you by the question. I'm just putting a disclaimer out there. I'll try and buy them off with barbecue. But go ahead. So what happens when there is an instance of instance of breach? So is it depending on the contracting officer? Okay, this is your warning or can it be a, a, a cause of a contract termination? How does it work? So what is most likely to happen? is that if you have a breach and you report it, they're gonna to wanna to know, again, how it happened, what you were doing to stop it, and what you're gonna to do to remediate so that particular thing doesn't happen again. And depending on whether the first pieces of what did you already do to prevent this and what steps you were taking, if those things are in violation of the particular requirements of these future regulations that are gonna come out, in that particular instance, you're probably either going, most likely you're not gonna face an FCA or false claim issue. Most likely they're either gonna say, okay, well, you need to be you need to have X number of things done to correct the problem. And that's on you and I'm paying for that. Um, or if it's really bad and something was seriously compromised, technically you're in breach of contract because these regulations are gonna be incorporated. Again, if you take the 889 analogy, they're probably gonna start incorporating these into all contracts um, or a good majority of the contracts. And you're gonna to have to start complying right away. There might be you know, claims you can raise or things for cost. But if you discover something and you didn't violate the regulation, if it was something wishy-washy where the language isn't that clear and you can be interpreted differently, they're probably just gonna say, okay, thanks. You explained to me how it's gonna fix it. I'm gonna put that in the file. And then it's only if you violate what you said you were going to do that I think you'll run into real problems. That's the most likely scenario. So you have to drink your own champagne and live up and do it. Right. Yes. <laughs> nice idea. All right. Any last questions before we wrap? Oh boy. <laughs> All right. So what's called responsible is integrator. So I'm not an OEM. I am not a supplier. I am not used. Super, I, I'm integrated. So, in terms of ball and what I'm responsible for, how does that work for me as the integration of the person who's going to work a solution and put the parts together? So, I think to get specific, I mean, it's, but it, I think it depends. <laughs> on the <part> of <laughs> Because, because the, Wait, the, the lawyer, right? The <laughs> Wait, he's going to have to charge you. Because this was just where it goes downhill very well. <laughs> <hard. laughs> like, if you actually pay money, he'll tell you something other than it depends. <laughs> <laughs> if the regs are out right. and it had the rules written down, right. I would say I would, I would say what it, what it is. But I, I think because of the way 889 works, is that there is going to be certain requirements that you check with the companies that you're working with and whatever components you're using as part of the integration service. So if you look at like 889, let's say you're using certain routers and things of that nature, you cannot provide routers from the prohibited companies, right? You have to actually check and make sure there aren't, the routers aren't from a Huawei or there aren't different components. Similarly, whether it's the software components or the hardware as well, you're probably going to have to get the SBOM or certain information from them. And I think as this really takes off, 
the big companies are going to have that already. And the really big companies, like your Microsofts in the world and stuff like that, I, I can't say for certain, actually. I should probably not say this, but I think most of what they're doing is is like uh, is proprietary code and stuff like that. So they're probably doing it all internally. I don't, I don't know. People might know whether they're, whether they're pulling in a bunch of open source stuff. Um, but if they're doing like Windows or Word or whatever, right, they probably did most of that code themselves over years. And there's not a lot really that they need to tell you about. It's like, this was ours. We made this. Um, and that's the kind of thing where the big companies probably already have that. They already be able to provide it. It's the little guys where maybe you're using someone who has some really unique solution. Some of the companies I work with do some of the They take certain um, COTS products, like video cards and things like that, right? And build these boxes that can process a bunch of different things. And then they put their own proprietary firmware or like software controller on top of it. That's where you're going to have more of an issue. And you're going to have to probably pass this along to them to have them either certify to you that they've uploaded this thing wherever it's supposed to go or provide it directly to you, which they might not want to do. Um, and then you're probably going to want to have them indemnify you for something that's missing. And then there's also probably going to be some sort of component or element of this where you have to do your due diligence. And again, going back to the FCA, the reckless disregard is sort of putting your head in the seat. So if, you, if you're working with some company and let's say they're showing you a product now and the splash screen for the EULA pops up and they click through it really, and it's all in Cyrillic, right? You probably can't just say, ah, that's fine. I'm probably going to say, we're going to take away from it. Uh, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> good. So that's the kind of thing where you think it should on reckless disregard for the truth because there's something that was shown to you. And I can almost guarantee, too, there's going to be some component of diligence that's going to be required. And so, not just taking a certification and saying, all right, I'm, I'm good, um, you're probably going to have to do some sort of homework. Okay. Right on you. Okay. But I appreciate it. So, are you going to be around for barbecue? I will be around. And to have people ask the questions if they want? Yes, for free. For free. For free. <laughs> for free. Do you want to write that down? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. Shai is going to answer questions for free. You said it off. Before Sai is your man, man. Yes. I've been putting out some really good stuff on it. And if you just need to cry, it's fine. Sai can be there for you, right? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. We have our last public service announcement. If you have not put your business card in here for the drawing for all the things over there, we will be doing that after we talk with Miss Sarah. We also have a couple more things in front of you guys. All right. Last but not least. Let me please introduce to you guys, Sarah Dunn, partner of GovTech Insurance. Sarah. This is Stephanie. Who are you and what makes you an expert in your field? Okay, well, first off, before I answer that question, hi, y'all. Thank you for coming out today. I know it's been a long day, but I'm glad to have all of you uh, in the room physically, so that's really cool. I and know. it's freezing room, so we acknowledge the breathing. I am breathing, just so you guys know, like I am sitting here shaking and I'm like, oh my God. So, yes, we know. I know Stephanie and I are getting used to our heels again, so that's always a fun one. It's awful. It's, yeah, it's not it. But um, with that being said, I want to just introduce myself. So, my name is Sarah Dunn. I'm an employee benefits and insurance advisor with the Capital Group as well as GovTech Insurance. I'm also the founder of a elite uh, CEO networking group, uh, female focused called Women in GovCon. Uh, Lynn, I know is familiar. She's uh, had the pleasure of taking home one of our Ferraris for the day. Uh, we do some pretty cool stuff. But enough about that. Wait, are there Ferraris at the end of this? Uh, <laughs> so, holy shit, that sounds awesome. Let's do that. that. Okay, sorry, Sarah. No, but I'll talk about insurance, but then let's talk about it. Ferraris. That's always the fun stuff. I love going fast cars and I love barbecue too, being from Texas. So thank you for that one. Um, with that being said, so what I'm here to talk to you today is all that fun stuff, cyber insurance. I know this is the top of your brains all the time. Um, however, if it isn't, it should be because as we've discussed about the solar winds today, you know the costs associated are upwards of $90 million for cyber insurance. So it's a big deal. 
and it is affecting all size companies because if you do not have cyber insurance, guess who that rolls on to? Either suburb prime, whatever position you're in. Me. So I don't have ninety million, million dollars or a Ferrari. What else? We're going to work on that though. We're going to work on both. So. Um, that being said, I know you want to ask me a few questions. So I do. Know. So I can tell you guys. So uh, small business owner, right? Like we've heard death and destruction from everyone, including the lawyers who were like mandatory disclosure, all the things, right? This is kind of a scary topic, but hopefully some ways out. What can I do to protect myself as a CEO? What insurance should I buy? Does insurance even really cover this crap? Like, I always feel like, sorry, and I'm just going to say it. I feel like the insurance people always screw you over in some way or form. So, like, what should I be on the alert for? And I can say that lovingly, but it's, sorry. It's like, it's like you love your lawyers. You love your insurance people, but I'm just saying. What you do I need to look out for? Yeah, you have the lawyer and the insurance broker. I kind of did. Yeah. We're, we're that's steering that's you into the mail. So there's a lot to answer that question, but I'm going to start with the basics. So for those in the room, I know we have some very intelligent people here. Um, however, there's some things that kind of go over most people's heads. So cyber insurance is the protection you have when that technology you have fails, when there has been complete catastrophe, whether that be data breach, extortion, theft, you name it all kind of falls in. However, what the problem is with insurance and something that affects each and every one of you is cyber insurance has become more of this umbrella term. And a lot of times with cyber insurance, what ends up happening is you have your policy baked into professional liability, okay? And while you don't want to have your policy baked into professional liability, I'm going to use a Texas phrase for you. So one torpedo takes down two ships. You don't want that. So when you have everything baked into your professional liability, meaning you have your cyber insurance baked in as an add-on, typically they're garbage. And what happens is you meet the excess of one policy and the other one, they're completely screwed. Meaning your costs go up and up and up astronomically, not essentially knowing what you have. So to explain a little bit deeper on that, what we see from time to time pretty commonly is you have your cyber policy baked into your professional liability as that add-on. But what you're not getting is the coverage that you actually need. And that is specific to exactly what you do and in your industry. So for example, if you are, let's say you're working on a, a naval ship and you have PHI, you have PII, you have proprietary info, you have everything that could go wrong. You have information stored on your computers that have the plans for your next naval ship or so be it. And all of that is liable. You're gonna have a much deeper uh, cyber insurance policy, having something more focused and more lengthy like that, as opposed to you selling produce and no one really cares about tracking the label on produce. What you care about is the plans for that new label ship. So with that being said, your cyber insurance policy is going to be much faster, probably much more expensive if you were just you know, working with produce. No one cares about that. But people care about their social security numbers. They care about those future plans. So with that being said, and knowing that cyber insurance is essentially this blanket term what is the, the number one thing that you need in your cyber insurance policy? Data breach. Data breach we've talked about before. This is the number one thing that you need to have in your cyber insurance policy. And you need to read through that policy. Because sometimes a lot of brokers and agents out there, they cherry pick, add it on your professional liability again, call it cyber policy, but it's really not what you have. So if data breach is not covered in your cyber insurance policy, you better find out, and you better find out why it isn't, and make sure that you have it. That breach is what we hear about all the time on the news. Sony, OPM, Blue Cross, you name it. Um, sure, there's plenty of information stored on each and every one of your computers that you probably would not want to share with the world. It happens, it completely happens. So that breach is number one that we always say you must have. There's another thing called social engineering. 
Does anyone have social engineering coverage or know if that's baked into their cyber insurance policy? You do? That's awesome. That's huge. Because a lot of people don't. And with what social, social engineering? I'm sorry. Great question. No problem. No problem. I, actually, now I'm all worried. Okay, yeah. What do we need? So social engineering coverage, a good a example is if you remember uh, back in the day, maybe you had like an elderly family member that would constantly, you know, receive these, these notifications of if you send $15,000 by X date, you know, you're fine. You're not going to have any penalties, but you have to send the money right now or a foreign prince requesting thousands of dollars and saying, if you don't do this right now, you know, you're done. Right. So social engineering is essentially pretending to be someone that you may not be. And it can get even deeper than that. So some things that you guys might face, and I know personally I was affected by it. Kristen knows too, she got the email. So what happens is young people have gotten so intelligent on technology that they are stealing signatures of your email. They can copy it, they can copy your, your exact email word for word, and it looks exactly like it's from the person that you trust. However, it's not. And what ends up happening is as soon as some person clicks that link, now Pandora's box is open. And as soon as you click that link, what ends up happening is that now your whole corporate email is hacked. And going back to data breach, as a government contractor, you need forensic costs. You have to have a forensic exam. And those costs are about $75,000 alone if it's not baked into your cyber insurance policy. So again, it's important to know what you have. So that amount is not on you. Another cost that's going to be associated to you is reporting costs. So those are around twenty to thirty thousand dollars alone. Ouch. So if you don't have that included in your cyber insurance policy, that's going to be on you too. All right. So key takeaways. First off, don't lump in cyber with anything else. Get a standalone policy. Exactly. Yes. And get a specific one that's specific to your industry. And if you don't know, what you have again you need to find out call your agent if they don't know what they sold you in your cyber policy or they say it's just a professional add-on then you're you with need the wrong agent, agent. you're yeah. with the wrong agent exactly and then the other side of it is to make sure that you have social engineering as i'm literally sitting here looking at one of my my colleagues because i'm like the exact same thing happened to us like it happens all the time i can't tell you how many times my name gets they're texting my employees i Thankfully, all of our employees know that I'm cheap as all get out, and I never want them to spend money or buy gift cards or do anything like that, because that's just basically our company culture. But you need to make sure that you have the social engineering as part of the standalone cyber policy. Mm -hmm. How much is this going to set me back? So, I hate to say this, but oh, it's it I know, you already call them bad guys, and we're going to get the same <laughs> bad guy answer. Oh, all right, Sarah. So well, it's going to talk to you a heck of a lot if you don't have what I mentioned before included because you know of the repercussions. So again, if you're only working on produce and all you're checking is labels, no one cares about that info. But again, if you have social security numbers and other stuff stored, people are going to care and your clients are going to care as well as your people that work for you. So Absolutely. any questions? Because I don't know about you guys, but I'm like, crap, all right, social engineering, didn't even realize, writing that down. Write that down. Um, also, uh, I know that we have a separate standalone policy, but I'm now rethinking everything about everything after this morning. Um, so. so I did because I know it's kind of new for some. Um, there is actually a cheat sheet because I love cheat sheets. I'm a big fan of Typically, we have our neuroscientists and in-house lawyer here for cyber things. Is in a better place right now? Don't worry, it's fine. The Caribbean is actually a better place. Um, it's in a way better place than the big home <laughs> conference room in Tyson's, but okay. So with that being said, there is a GovTech sheet um, for you. They actually have a cheat sheet of things that you can call your lawyer tomorrow. I'm not sorry, your lawyer. <laughs> We're both bad guys here. Uh, you can call your insurance broker tomorrow and ask them exactly, you know, do you have that social engineering coverage? Do you have, you know, there's four types of data. You have PHI, there's PAI, proprietary info, and PCI. If you have PCI listed in your cyber insurance policy, do y'all take credit cards? And the reason I say that is a lot of times we see PCI listed in your cyber insurance, and it's not relative to you guys. You guys are working on invoices. So you don't need to have PCI coverage unless you're taking credit cards from people, which at this point, probably few of you are in the room. So 
It's a little pointer. Because we're going to occasionally pay us by credit card. So I can see maybe, <laughs> right? Like, I think all of a sudden, Sam's, yes, we take credit card. Government, we'll take your money any way you want to give it to us. Just give it to us. That's all we want. And you can share it there in Bobo. You don't want your share. So, indeed. <laughs> any questions? I know that's kind of like, holy cow. I don't know about you guys, but I'm like literally writing this crap down, and that might be one of the key takeaways is um, everyone go home and check your cyber insurance policy because now it's an O moment. Um, Cy, fellow bad person. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, have you guys ever requ requested like communications, emails, and stuff like that, and guidance from a client of yours that they got from their lawyer? Because I had a client come to me for a particular policy. And the, the insurance company was asking for all communications that we had had with them. And I basically said, you don't want to do that yeah. because yeah. I've told you things that you don't, that are privileged yeah. and you don't want to share. Yeah, see in that situation, and maybe it might be a little bit different with my firm because my firm, we have an in-house attorney, but he's for insurance specifically. So he'll run through the contracts and stuff, but I don't feel like there would be a situation where he'd ask for your communications. I do. I think it would be like situation dependent. I don't know. Oh, they're getting it. Again, I just say it depends, but I don't personally think. And clearly, you work with me too. Do you no, know I've, I've never seen that. Never seen that. Um, I mean, not for us. It might be like maybe the insurance company that's important for the underwriter, but not. Not the broker. Not the broker. Yeah. yeah. I just. I thought that was crazy because yeah. it's all discoverable. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions for Sarah? Now that she scared us all and we're all going to go home and do our homework. And again, if your broker can't answer that question, then you need a new broker. Um, yeah, I feel strongly. I'm like, no, you're not. So. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The final thing. So I want to do, we are almost there, guys. I promise the barbecue is set up. They are out there. We have things to give away. And we have large integrators who are looking forward to meeting you. So before I get started, I would like uh, Troy from Uninet, who is around here somewhere, to at least start making your way here. I want to make sure that we have all the right people. Um, so let's go through the big guys real quick. We're going to let the bigs get out of the room, get their barbecue, and go outside to kind of like the atrium place. We've got uh, table cards set up so that you can I readily identify them. You guys have what they're looking for. If you don't have it, don't waste your time. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's kind of simple. That's why we gave it to you ahead of time. So, all right. Uh, Clarice Jackson. There she is. Miss F. Okay, please stand. Tell everyone hello. And you, and you are from? Amayad, thank you for joining us today. All right, uh, Robin Card. I'm with you. Okay, you. So you're not Robin, because that would be that might be weird, but it could be okay. I do have a William on here. You were just the second person. All right, so this is William from GDIT. So you guys get a visual for him. And you guys can get, feel free to go ahead and get, you guys get first dibs on all the barbecue. Leave us some, please. <laughs> all right, just a little. Um, Darren Mosley. Darren, Darren, where are you from? Uh, Lido. There it is, Lidos. Lidos is in the house. This is Darren over there. So you guys get a visual. I'm doing this purposely so you can put eyes on these people. John Long. John, where are you? I saw you around rolling around. Is he out there? He's probably eating barbecue. barbecue. Is he eating barbecue? <laughs> he might have cheated, but I can be wrong. He, he totally <laughs> jumped the line, right? That's what those mid tiers do, man. They jump the line over the big guys. All right, so John is here. I don't know if Mark is here. I think he is not here. But John Long is here from LMI. And then finally, Wayne Elvinfield. Wayne yeah. Evanfield. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And Wayne is with. Right. Verizon Federal. So thank you so for joining us. So this is Wayne and Wayne Leo Free, first dibs. We'll let the hungry vultures wait back here deliberately. We're going to tie them over with waiting while I am getting our basket. Troy, as our Uninet representative, and a shout out to Chris Crowder, who may or may not be on the Zoom call. Hey, Chris. Um, this is Troy from Uninet. 
And you are speaking on behalf of the internet because you are the fine people who brought us this barbecue. Thank you, Troy, for feeding us. We are. Yeah, we are. <laughs>
Derek has not been, was not able to make it. Okay. So they canceled on it um, very last minute. And we can connect you potentially. I mean, if you are interested in meeting with Derek, please see Katie. Because um, I'm a great business partner and totally just bonds it all off. Oh, and yes. she has received double in so while. So, and just so you guys know, um, the large guys have or the large firms have received all of your profiles. So the government profiles have already been open. All right, last but not least, we are so thankful, you guys. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here. I hope it was a good event. I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope that scared you a little, but not to the point where you can't do anything, and you guys see what's going on and what's coming out, and that you are not actually sucker punched yourselves. So, without further ado, please avail yourselves of all things barbecue, desserts, beer, pony up to all the people who got free booze and see if they'll share, and then go talk to the large friends in the atrium. Remember, please only talk to people that you actually have capabilities for, don't waste your time or theirs. And I will be here for at least probably 20, 30, 40 minutes, depending on how much fare you give them. So let's just see how that happens. Afterwards, and that's how you get the slide deck because we're not. <laughs> <laughs>